Real Chat Episode 35, Total Recall. Your mind. It is the center of your life. It is everything you hear. Everything you see. Everything you feel. It is everything you are. How would you know if someone stole your mind? Arrest that woman! Quaid. Cut. Get ready for a surprise. We can't let him run around. He knows too much. They've got your bug. I get a lock. There! And the bug's in your skull. Take this thing out of the case and stick it up your nose. Don't worry, it's self-guiding. Got him. I lost him. Welcome to Mars. You got a lot of nerve showing your face around here. Look who's talking. your identity and implanted a new one if i'm not me who the hell am i he's got a holograph welcome to johnny cab drive where can i take you tonight <laughs> please fasten your seatbelt. i want clay delivered alive for re-implantation that's for making me come to mars you wouldn't hurt me after all we're married Consider that a divorce. We hope you enjoyed the ride. Get ready for the ride of your life. Everybody, welcome to episode 35 of Real Chat, a podcast that promises week in, week out, the real world as we know it. Today we're looking at 1990s Total Recall. Yes, 1990s Total Recall. Not, I repeat, not 2012's Total Recall. My name is Adam Stolfo, and I am joined here as usual by good friend and co-host Brose Vard. Brose, how are you doing? I'm okay. I, I'm having trouble remembering that there was a remake in 2012. I mean, I did go into the recall facility and have that erased. Um, <laughs> But it is kind of popping back I, into my head now. I, I but in, in all seriousness, because uh, I haven't seen the remake, has anyone I, else actually seen the remake? I, I haven't seen it. I know Stu, yeah. who uh, is a regular here, he's seen it, but uh, I don't know. Have you seen it? No. In uh, fact, on principle, I don't it's a, want to see Total Recall. It's meant to be terrible. Refusing yeah. to see a film on principle is yeah, the yeah. worst excuse I've ever heard. But um, And one I frequent. The, uh, <laughs> I see, I, I this, this one I should, I should see. I recently watched the Robocop reboot, and I love... That was good. That was a good... I one. love Robocop, the original... But the reboot was fine. Yeah, I liked it. Like, um, Michael Keaton is phenomenal in it. Yeah. And th- there's enough similar and enough different, and the action's great. The Robocop reboot's fine. It's a fine it film. in a different direction. Yeah, yeah. And, and it was still funny, but in a different way. It wasn't yeah. as ironic, I guess. But I'm happy to see Total Recall. I, I, I've heard that it's pretty ordinary, but um, and it looks more like the fifth element to me than Total Recall, but <laughs> I'm happy to check it out. I better do the formal intro just quickly for oh. Michael Hadjian. Oh, the yeah. return. Am, yeah. Michael, how you doing? <laughs> good, good, thanks. Yeah. yeah. Look, excited to talk about this film. I think anyone who... Um, you know, in their thirties or, or early forties, that grew up this film is you know, and is male and loves super violence or love this film. So, uh. Jeez, I tell you what, <laughs> Paul Verhoeven movies. I mean, we're going to talk yeah. about it a little bit as we get into it, though. But I mean, the yeah. extreme violence and sexual references yeah. and stuff that Paul Verhoeven puts in yeah. his films is iconic for it, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, and just extremely satisfying. <laughs> <laughs> this is an episode of our Vintage Vault retrospective series, a conscious effort to tie in selected shows with something of relevance to the present. And being 2015, it's the 25-year anniversary of Total Recall. It is indeed. Yeah. I mean, yeah, just quickly, the new one. Any interest at all in seeing it? I don't think any of us have, so... I think I should see it, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, I reckon I'll check it out. Interest, we'll check, we'll inter- word interest is strong, but I probably should see it. Oh, yeah. Just so oh, yeah. we, we feel qualified yeah. to be able to you know, talk about the differences between the two as yeah. well. So Total Recall is loosely based on a short story called... 
We Can Remember It For You Wholesale by American novelist Philip K. Dick and first published in the April 1966 issue of the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. The original screenplay for the film was written by Dan O'Bannon and Ronald Shusett, the writers of Alien. Legends. Who had brought the rights to Philip K. Dick's short story while Dick was still alive. They were unable to find a backer for the project and it drifted into development hell, passing from studio to studio. Heard that term a few times Indeed. recently. Indeed. In the mid 1980s, producer Dino De Laurentiis took on the project with Richard Dreyfus attached to Star. Yeah, phenomenal, isn't it? Patrick Swayze, who had recently starred in Dirty Dancing, was also considered for the role. In 1987, it was announced that De Laurentiis would make the film as the first production for his DEL company at the new De Laurentiis Film Studios on the Gold Coast in Australia, <laughs> with Bruce Beresford to direct from a screenplay by O'Bannon and Shusett. This film obviously did not ever eventuate. David Cronenberg was attached to direct, yeah. but wanted to cast William Hurt in the lead role. Cronenberg described his work on the project and eventual falling out with Shusett, saying, I worked on it for a year and did about 12 drafts. Eventually, we got to a point where Ronald Shusett said, you know what you've done? You've done the Philip K. Dick version. I said, isn't that what we're supposed to be doing? And he said, no, no, we want to do Razor the Lost Ark Goes to Mars. Yeah. Oh. When the adaption of Dune flopped at the box office, De Laurentiis similarly lost enthusiasm for the project. Although he went uncredited in the final version of the film, Cronenberg originated the idea of mutants on Mars, including the character of Coato. Oh, wow. Film there you go. Well. Not so, surprising from Cronenberg. Yeah. Yep. The collapse of De Laurentiis' company provided an opening for Schwarzenegger, who had unsuccessfully approached the producer about starring in the film. He persuaded Carolco to buy the rights to the film for a comparatively cheap $3 million and negotiated, how's this, he's already got his business thing going, negotiated a salary of 10 to $11 million, wow. Wow. plus 15% of the film's profits, to star in it, with the unusually broad degree of control over the production. This is really interesting, this, Bruce, in regards to Schwarzenegger's actual contribution to this movie creatively. He obtained veto power over the producer, director, screenplay, co-stars, and promotion. The first thing that Schwarzenegger did was personally recruit Paul Verhoeven. I mean, that's, that's genius right there. Yeah. <laughs> um, to direct the film, having been impressed by the Dutch director's Robocop a couple well, of years I before. Well, I also read in the lead-up to today's podcast that Schwarzenegger was considered for Robocop early on. Yep. But it was the costuming that wouldn't have worked with his physicality, and that's why he was uh, um, eventually uh, passed over for it. Yep. Yeah. And uh, when he saw the success of Robocop, he must have been pretty frustrated, pretty annoyed. Particularly being a couple of years after Terminator. <laughs> yeah. As well. Yeah, exactly. So it's a, I'd, I'd not heard that before, but that's no, remarkable. Just I, heard that. I can't even imagine Schwarzenegger in Robocop. It's yeah, so bizarre. Which is interesting because, you know, Robocop and the Terminator are very similar, you know, similar yeah. together. By this time, the script had been through 42 drafts, but it still lacked the third act. Verhoeven talks about that too, when he was offered the job and he'd signed the contract and then they told him, oh, by the way, this is draft 42. We still haven't solved the problem. <laughs> 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 yeah. uh, I love it. So Gary Goldman was therefore brought in by Paul Verhoeven to work with Ronald Schusser to develop the final draft of the screenplay. The director also brought in many of his collaborators on Robocop, including actor Ronnie Cox, cinematographer awesome. Jost Vacano, production designer William Saddle, editor Frank J. Uriset, and special effects designer Rob Bottin. So Robocop and Total Recall are often linked together because of, you know, obvious reasons. I mean, Verhoeven's just all over them both. Yeah. But yeah, you can definitely see why when there's the, you know, so many collaborators on both of these projects. Yeah, for sure. So, yeah, um, in the um, special features on the Blu-ray, Verhoeven's constantly pointing out, oh, here's from Robocop, he's from Robocop, he's from Robocop. So yeah. 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 So what are your initial thoughts on, on this film, guys? And now 25 years down the track, so of its legacy as well uh, I love this film um, yeah I watched it you know a couple of days ago just to refresh my memory and um I'd call it the um, the thinking man's popcorn flick. Like you, you can sort of you can sit down and, and watch this film and turn your brain off and get a fantastic ride out of it. It's you know it's a, it's an amazing action adventure film, but you can choose to really pay attention to it. And I think there's actually quite a lot of depth in it in terms of the the storyline, and it's you can pick up new things every time you watch it. And I actually got a lot out of it this most recent time, and I'm sure we'll sort of talk about that at length you know during this podcast. But it's it's a fantastically complicated film. This is the greatness of Paul Verhoeven and. I don't know. History will tell whether he gets regarded as great as he is a director. But he uses, you know, violence and sex 
to tell quite complex social commentary stories. Oh, completely. Yeah. So you can look at this, like you said, as it's just a black and white action film if you want it to be. But he's make, he makes so many comments about the way society runs or the way... In this film in particular, it's about government and governance and, and it's about authority and, and the police state and things like that. And all these films... And I mean, Showgirls is another one that... If you watch Showgirls, <laughs> Showgirls stands up a lot better now than it did at the time because once you understand where Verhoeven's coming from, it is absolutely brilliant film and it's not even one of those films that's so bad it's good because i hate that phrase it's a good solid at least the message in it is solid the film is tacky and cheesy but that was yeah. intentional as well that's not by accident Verhoeven has such control over the craft and especially when you know working in popcorn areas but still having something to say he's, he's phenomenal yeah. and he does tongue in cheek so well there is a lot so of well. to humor uh, through all, all of his films and they just work great a lot of irony yeah and some yeah. great twists and turns in this one too definitely the concept of quaid being a physically buffed construction worker was, surprise, surprise, suggested by Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> um, in the earlier drafts of the script, Quaid, originally named Quail as well. Did you know this? Uh, Douglas Quail in the short story. Correct. Yeah. Yep. It was originally described as an average looking accountant type person. Which explains why guys like, I don't know, William Hurt was mentioned yeah. earlier. And yeah. there were seven actors linked to it. But yeah, they were, they're yeah. not the big muscle bound freaks. Yeah, I suppose so. it could have just been a standard double agent sort of thing. Could, anyone could have played the role. Yeah. 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 You- was um, Lance Henriksen linked to this? <laughs> <laughs> Did that, was that a thing? surprise me. It's, it's a good chance. A lot of Schwarzenegger's characters were originally more everyman sort of looking men. Which makes know? sense so. because who's going to write a film thinking they're going to get someone that looks like Schwarzenegger anyway? <laughs> yeah, you know? like, so true. And it, there's a huge drop in Hollywood at this time. You know, it's Schwarzenegger or Lou Ferrino. So, you know, you kind of... <laughs> It's a big gap between those two freakazoids. So. Yeah. Because of this detail, when the movie was originally going to be produced by Dino De Laurentiis, he was adamant about not letting Schwarzenegger audition for the role of Quaid. It was only after Schwarzenegger convinced Mario Casa, one of the producers, to buy this, the script rights from De Laurentiis, whose production company went bankrupt, that the later drafts were rewritten to change Quaid's character into one more suitable for Schwarzenegger to play. Schwarzenegger said that he felt this helped the story even more, giving a much stronger contrast to it by turning a character who is otherwise powerfully physically into a character that becomes vulnerable after having his mind stolen. Yeah. That is such a Schwarzenegger comment there as well. <laughs> yeah. He'll justify anything to yeah, get yeah. himself into like one of these films, like one of these big popular movies, won't he? So Listening to him talk about this film, knowing that he got 15% of the gross, you can see why he smiles the whole time he talks about this film because oh, yeah. it's still paying his mortgage. The um, <laughs> But yeah, I do love the way he, he, he kind of reasons things around to, to him starring in something and that's fine. Total Recall is a correct Rolko Pictures release. It was released on the 1st of June 1990 in the US and the 6th of December 1990 in Australia. It was shot primarily in Mexico City, Mexico, which is something I thought I would be all over, but I actually didn't know that the entire film was shot in Mexico. No, I didn't know. Yeah, and that was done for budgetary reasons. The amount of money, $65 million was the rumoured budget yeah, for this, I think. $65 million dollar budget. Um, and they went to Mexico because crew is cheaper and, and, and production facilities are cheaper, um, accommodations are cheaper. They could just do it for a lot less and they could take over 12 or 13 sound stages in Mexico City, whereas in America or in, in, in Hollywood, they may have only had access to maybe three or four sound stages because all the other films in production. So it's a lot easier to shoot and quicker when you've got all the sets built at the same time and just go around yeah. and shoot them all. But yeah, the effect shots were done in Hollywood still though. Yeah, the futuristic subway station and vehicles are actually part of the Mexican public transportation system with the subway cars painted grey and television monitors were added, obviously, for that whole future feel. Mm, yeah. And, the, yeah, the big concrete building is the Mexican uh, Military Academy as well, which is used all over the place. And, again, the same idea. They put up a few futuristic-looking things. So, like you said, bros, the budget was an estimated $65 million, but it grossed $261,299,000. So it was actually quite the hit, particularly yeah. considering it was an R-rated film. Yeah. And R here in Australia, for those that don't know as well, is 18 plus. So you're taking out a huge dynamic. Huge of your, yeah, of it's your a big f- commercial risk to do that, yeah. but it's obviously paid off massively. Because Robocop was R as well, wasn't it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And Verhoeven I, and massively violent, like, <laughs> look yeah. at these films. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I don't know. Like, I mean, I'm sure the, we haven't seen it yet, but I'm sure the remake of Total Recall isn't as violent as this. Wouldn't no, even be as, yeah. it wouldn't even be near as close. No, I and don't it's think not so. R. It's yeah, it's not the same sort of film, as far as I know. Yeah. 
So we've spoken about him a little bit, but let's talk about him a little bit more. Paul Verhoeven, he's a Dutch film director, screenwriter, and producer who has made movies in the Netherlands and the United States. Like we said, explicit, violent, and or sexual content and social satire are trademarks of both his drama and science fiction films. He is best known in the US for directing the science fiction films Robocop, Total Recall, and Starship Troopers, and the erotic thriller Basic Instinct. And of course, he also did Hollow Man in 2000 as well. Oh. Not quite as iconic, but... Um, <laughs> Shocker. Have you seen that, bro? I haven't, I haven't seen it, no. Is it I, Kevin Bacon? Okay, it is Kevin Bacon. Yeah. yeah. It's very forgettable. His films altogether received a total of nine Academy Award nominations, mainly for editing and effects. So, that's, so two things that a lot of his films have been nominated for. Yeah. He won the good old Saturn Award, bros, uh, for Robocop as well, for directing. In contrast, he won the Golden Raspberry Awards for Worst Picture and Worst Director for Showgirls, bros. Yeah, ninety five. Like I said, I think it's a it's a it's a misunderstood classic. Showgirls. I've I actually seen. I watched it again recently, and I hadn't seen it since it was at the cinema. I think. Do you think twenty years down the track, it can be more appreciated for I, what it is? Yeah, I think so. It was I think panned. so. It was canned. It was universally panned, but I, it was panned because I think people thought that he was falling into melodrama and falling into soap opera, but they were the tools he was using to tell yeah. this tale, and he. He masters it. He nails it. The, it's still got the same over-the-top kind of sexual elements. There's still a fair bit of violence in Showgirls. But the story he tells is really good. I, I think it's a good film. Yeah. It's not as good as, you know, you just listed Basic Instinct, Total Recall, Robocop. They're great films. I mean, but it's a good, solid film, and he's obviously still in control of his... Starship Troopers. Starship Troopers is a great film. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I think it, I don't know. It's, it's judged unfairly, I think. Paul Verhoeven, he is just like, particularly in this era, in the late 80s, early 90s, he is just a man of entertainment, this guy. Like, yeah. you know, if you want to go to the in movies and enjoy it and have a, a huge laugh and a real, like, yeah, like sort of yeah. moment, his directing is phenomenal. I just don't think they do violence like this anymore. No, like, just the, the stylistic now. violence that he does in his films. Like, if you see, like, when, when the guys are getting shot on the escalator in, in, um, oh, in Total Recall, oh, yeah. that's and phenomenal. you see those, like, yeah. what they call squibs, where the um, where the, the bullet holes sort of explode off the, um, off the characters, they're huge. They're like baseball size, like explosions <laughs> coming off these characters. It, like they well, just don't do um, that anymore. It's yeah. just so the, uh, top and bloody. The train passenger who uses a shield yeah, for a good chunk guy, of that. That guy gets destroyed. Oh, Does yeah. his head come off at some point? Like it's just, <laughs> it's just, he would be held together by toothpicks. That it's guy just is insane. <laughs> but um, the other thing, though, is I, I wonder with this film because everything's done with squibs and they're all practical effects, actually, except for the X-ray. There is a cartoony element to it, like when yeah. Ironside oh, loses yeah. his hands and things. Like it's still a very brutal, violent. Moment, but there is still a slapsticky, it's comical, comical yeah, you don't element go, to it. It's not shocking. You're Whereas not like now, if, by it. if they CGI all that stuff, or it look really brutal, and you don't want it to look too realistic, it kind of yeah. helps that it's a bit That's fantastical. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yet violence, the way it's done today, is a lot more realistic, done for shock value and to yeah. really make people like you know look at the you know wide mouth, like you know what the hell did I just watch? Back in these days, as you said, it was over the top and comic book like, and it's just done for hilarity. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. it's kind of a morbid idea that we'd sit around laugh laughing. Your, oh, at this it's, kind of it's classic. You can't, you can't help but laugh your head off about like the fact that the filmmaker has created this image purely to get this to get this yeah. response out of you. Yeah, you know, and that's what Verhoeven does, probably as well or better than anyone else. Oh, yeah, and it's right through the film. It's unrelenting. It just stop. Yeah, well, I don't know what the head count in this film is of just brutal oh, actually, deaths. Actually, you know what it is? You know what it is? What is it? 77. Wow. 77 That's people awesome. die in this movie. <laughs> Not quite as many as Commando, but, you know, it's... Uh, <laughs> Let's, let's but also, there. I mean, also with Verhoeven, I guess all that sort of crazy, mindless, fun stuff aside, he's quite a political sort of director as oh, well. And definitely. if you look at, if we just think of his sort of, I guess, big three being sort of Robocop, this film Total Recall, and um, and Starship Troopers, they're all sort of pretty much about totalitarian regimes. Like, and, and I was actually doing a bit of reading. There's, there's a lot of people that think they're actually all in the same universe. So they think that... Sort yeah, of, there is a fan theory about yeah, that. Yeah, that Robocop was this sort of start of this sort of um, corporatocracy where sort of corporations take over the state and sort of develop these robots. And then sort of in the future, you get to Total Recall where it's sort of the extreme of that, where a corporation's actually running a planet, and, you know, as, as Total say in it. And then, and then there's a the collapse of that, obviously, when, when Cohagen gets taken down and then sort of... Fast forward years later into the future, you got Starship Troopers, which is more the, I guess, the fascism side. Like the, I guess, it's, they're kind of like the Nazis essentially, and just you know, uh, you know, uniting the people against this sort of hidden enemy in the, you know, which is great as well because space. yeah, which is really great as well. I, I, I go with that to yeah. an extent. I wouldn't say that I would like you know like take it as gospel, yeah. but um, I think there's a visual style and a visual yeah. continuity. I mean, there at the end of the day, well. though, it reflects Verhoeven's skill as a director and yeah. that he's created his his own universe when it comes yeah. to his films and there are similarities between them and he's, he's, he is masterful no question about it yeah. did you call yourself a fan 
I appreciate his skills and his talents, and I think he's phenomenal and underrated as a director, yeah. Yeah, he's sort of disappeared now as well. I mean, he hasn't disappeared. He's still making films, but he's, he definitely left the US and went back, you know, went back home and, yeah. you know, making films back there again. So he sort of did this big US stint where he really made a name for himself. Yeah. And then decided he had enough, and maybe it's because of the fact that he, he can't do these movies anymore, or that all the studios yeah. wouldn't make them today. So yeah, yeah, it's yeah. almost like he just got in there for an era and he told his story and you know presented them the way he wanted to and now he's yeah he's done yeah you know yeah. he's had some- i guess the other thing too is that especially with starship troopers you don't want the audience 100 percent aware of the more social commentary elements of his films that's nice as the underpinning yeah. kind of uh, background or the, the 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 backstory of something and maybe it just got to the point where i don't know it was a bit too obvious that that's what he was doing a bit but too political a bit too yeah. political yeah yeah maybe yeah. Yeah. maybe so there is quite a number of people credited for writing this film i uh, will start with philip k dick uh, who wrote the short story we can remember it for you wholesale philip kindred dick was an american novelist short story writer essayist and philosopher whose published works mainly belong to the genre of sci-fi dick explored philosophical sociological, political, and metaphysical themes in novels dominated by monopolistic corporations, authoritarian governments, and altered states of consciousness. In his later works, Dick's thematic focus strongly reflected his personal interest in metaphysics and theology. He often drew upon his own life experience in addressing the nature of drug abuse, paranoia, schizophrenia, and transcendental experiences in novels such as A Scanner Darkly and Vellus. Later in life, he wrote non-fiction on philosophy, theology, and the nature of reality and science. You can really see a lot of that in Total Recall, can't you? Oh, big time in terms of schizophrenia and uh, is it a dream, is it not a dream, is uh, massively part of the Yeah, movie. Philip K. Dick's one of those great authors too where his films can kind of, his, his books or his stories can be kind of turned into two different types of films. You can easily make a Total Recall which is very action-packed and very violent or, or whatever, but then you can get something something like uh, Blade Runner or something, which is a very considered and intellectual kind of take on the similar material. He's written some of the greatest sci-fi films of all time yeah, based on his books. I don't so. know if you guys have seen A Scanner Darkly, but that's yeah. a pretty cool oh, film. Oh, that's a great well. film. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I haven't seen it yet, but I want yeah. to. No, it's good. In addition to 44 published novels, Dick wrote approximately 121 short stories, most of which appeared in science fiction magazines during his lifetime. Although Dick spent most of his career as a writer in near poverty, 11 popular films based on his works have been produced, including Blade Runner, Total Recall, A Scanner Darkly, Minority Report, Paycheck, Screamers, The Adjustment Bureau, and Imposter. And this was the first, or one of his, one of the first of his to sell to Hollywood as well. Yeah. And I think looking there, most of them have been a success, or at least enough of a success. Yeah. Yeah, they're good solid films. Good directors taking on uh, good material. Yeah, Yeah, it's good. Also credited with writing the film, we mentioned him before, Ronald Shusett for the screen story and Dan O'Bannon as well, and also for the story John Povell. And then the screenplay credit goes to Ronald Shusett, Dan O'Bannon, and Gary Goldman. Gary Goldman uh, was brought in by Verhoeven after he'd signed on to, to make the film, and a lot of the writers were on set during production, and so stuff was still being written and rewritten on set. Um, Verhoeven you know, likes to count himself as being very writer-friendly. A lot of writers aren't allowed on set, aren't allowed anywhere near the set, whereas Verhoeven's more than happy to have them around. And I think that helps the film. Yeah. In, in some moments, they could adjust and rewrite. I think and, they'd almost um, work like an advisor occasionally, where, yeah. like, you know, you consider the director would sort of... Some directors don't want the writer anywhere near the set. Yeah, either. I know. So, yeah. But, yeah, this, this, it sounds like they had a good relationship, and Gary Goldman came up with a lot of the kind of the key elements in the, in the final draft that, that made the film work. So, Michael, do you see any of Ronald Schuster and Dan O'Bannon in this script as well, based on the other stuff that you know that they've what done? What else have those guys done? Well, Alien's the big one. Oh, that's the big one, yes, of yeah, course. I mean, as far as I know, yeah, I've, I've seen Alien and I've seen this one. They're the ones, obviously, I'm conscious that they've both written. Um, it's, it's hard to actually line up the two films, really. They're very different films. I mean, they're both sci-fi. Um, yeah, but very different takes. Yeah, I, 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 can't, yeah. I, I couldn't have watched those two films in isolation and gone, oh, they're the same writers. They're, they're just very different. Um, the cinematographer I mentioned before, Jost Vacano or Vacano or something, I think is how you pronounce it. This film it has a really oh, wow. unique look, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. I mean, Particularly all the stuff on Mars. So Vacano worked on Robocop and Starship Troopers. So he's worked with Verhoeven extensively. And cinematography is amazing. This And the color palette is really good. And considering there's a lot of location shooting too it's, it's yeah. remarkable how consistent they've made it look and, and how good it is there's a real distinction between Earth and Mars isn't there like Earth is all very sort of grey green palette whereas yeah. you go to Mars it's red everything's red and like you know that's, that's really in your face and it works really well it tells you, you know, where you are it certainly oh. does you know what this film does look like it looks I know it's 1990 but this film looks like an 80s film at least yeah. a, a, oh, the, the fashion is a big part Every, everything, the fashion is a classic it's, it's very 80s the 80s aren't over yet in 1990 yeah. there's still a hangover yeah, Absolutely. definitely feels like yeah. an 80s film yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's so many 
wonderfully choreographed action scenes in this film as well. Uh, the, the cinematography is like you know it can't be it can't be underplayed. Oh yeah, it's, it's incredible. a significant part of the. No, definitely, the film. It, it creates a whole tone of the film and it, it, it nails it. And especially, uh, I think some of the Mars sets. That Mars set where, where the strip clubs and everything are, it's quite a small set. Yeah, the it's Venus, the Venus Yeah, the red light district. The, yeah. it, Venusville. It might be, it might be a, a, like it's a large sound stage. Those kind of sets can get very claustrophobic very quickly if you're not careful yeah. about how you shoot it. And so he kind of uses the fact that it's a, a reasonably small area to his advantage. There's a couple of sequences where he'll shoot the exact same shot so intentionally makes it repetitive rather than it being accidentally, oh, that's the same location we were two minutes ago. And he uses those quite well. And it, it's tough. It's tough when that whole area is just one set and they've got to make it look like so many different things throughout the, the shooting. But he nails that stuff as well. Definitely. And also just all the, the I guess, the, the, in the production design, all the buildings they use, these sort of sort of very squarish concrete monstrosities, they're very... Um, I don't know if anyone's been to sort of like Munich or Berlin and where you see these sort of ex-Nazi buildings, the ones that, have, you know, haven't been destroyed. They're very much the same thing, just these really massive blockish, like, metre-thick concrete walls. Like, it is very much goes with the theme of the film, this sort of totalitarian, you know, thing that's going on, you know, in this, in this dystopian future. And it works really well. They've obviously done their homework and, and, and brought that into the film. So let's talk about the iconic cast and I know I use the word iconic a lot when I talk about the cast, but I mean... You use it every time we talk about the cast of any film. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's because most of the films that we've looked at really do have they are, we do look nature. At, we are they are at. iconic, the cast. So um, Arnold Schwarzenegger plays Douglas Quaid-Hauser Hauser. in this film. Um, he's a construction worker who discovers that he's actually a secret agent formerly named Hauser, who travels to Mars to uncover his true identity and why his memory was erased. You know how back when we did Commando Bros, you said that Arnold Schwarzenegger's got like a small block of really, really strong movies? This is one of them. Total Recall's one of them, without a doubt. For me, uh, especially watching it this time, Arnold Schwarzenegger's actually acting in this film. Yeah. yeah. And, and we've spoken a lot about Schwarzenegger's acting over the Terminator franchise and then Commando as well. But in this film... There's some real subtleties to his performance, and there's some real tender moments. And I mean, the romantic scenes early on are a bit awkward with watching Schwarzenegger for some reason, but he's really got some depth here, and he really works hard on the. I, I, I Which guess scenes the jump out. Which the, scenes? The, the, the jump Quaid out. stuff before he um, goes to recall, I guess, are the strong bits in terms of his performance. Some real subtle reactions to things, that confusion and the desire to go to Mars. He just underplays it, and but just nails it, and he's. You're probably not going to see him act any better in any other film. This, this film doesn't yeah. work if Schwarzenegger can't do those sequences either. If Quaid's not confused and he's not panicked and he's not rushing around, it, like it, the whole thing falls down. And I, he's, yeah. he's exceptional. I, it, it actually surprised me how much depth he has. But of course, it has Schwarzenegger <laughs> moments in there as well. Oh, so uh, yeah. I, I think every line in this film is funny, like to me, oh, like, like everything it, he like, says. <laughs> <laughs> Even the most subtle little, little sentence that he says, like, is funny. Yeah, yeah. The, and, um, and I just, like, uh, I mean, he, he does have some depth and sort of nice moments, but then there's, like, when he finds out that, that his wife's not really his wife and he, like, smashes her in the face. Nice knowing you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, nice yeah. knowing you. Yeah, just yeah, like, I know. Yeah. It surely wouldn't yeah. recover from that that quickly. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it devastated. Ten years together, eight years together. Yeah, eight years. Yeah, nice this film you. does have some of the great Arnie lines, though. Like, yeah. Consider that a divorce. you! <laughs> 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 The other thing I love is the noises Schwarzenegger makes when he's struggling in this are hilarious. <laughs> oh, they are hilarious, those moments. Well, this is certainly a golden age of Arnie. This is like really the, 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 the epicenter of his, his awesomeness. It's probably for me, it's you know, 1987 with Predator to 1991 with Terminator 2. That's his pinnacle. He also did Kindergarten Cop the same year as this as well. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and that's a great Schwarzenegger performance. And he so done, it's yeah. right In terms of his actual solid acting, it's yeah, kind of twins through to Terminator 2 that is his peak as an actor. Yeah, He's yeah. actually delivering complex performances, as complex as he can be. Yeah. But it, that's pretty much it. Here's a question for you then. Take the Terminator films out of the equation. What do you think Schwarzenegger's best performance is? Because you'd, you'd go to the Terminators because it suits him best. But what do you think his best performance as a person? I think Kindergarten Cop is probably his best acting performance in terms of, of the range that he brings yeah. to a character. It's king, probably Kindergarten Cop. I would say Predator. Uh, yep, I, I was going to say Predator as well. Yeah. I think that's his best dramatic 
performance. Yeah. Like, yeah. He's really solid in that film. Yeah. Um, I mean, he's still pretty shit, but that's probably his best effort. <laughs> yeah. I didn't say, didn't say he had yeah, to be yeah, great. Yeah. I just said yeah, what yeah. was his best. That's right. So, yeah. Rachel DeCotton plays Melina. Um, this is an interesting choice, isn't it? Yeah. It's one of those weird things that happens to Schwarzenegger where they kind of, he gets paired with ethnically kind of ambiguous female leads. He, he doesn't have, Rarely does he have the traditional just blonde haired, blue eyed kind of lead. And I think the Sharon Stone casting, which we'll get to in a minute, was supposed to be a bit of a incongruous. It was supposed to be a bit incongruous in terms of you don't picture Schwarzenegger. For some reason, they don't think the public would picture him with a traditional American looking woman because they do the same thing in uh, Running Man and in yes. Commando as well. Yes. And they're all beautiful women and they're all great actors, but it's just that bizarre idea. And there's obviously some school of thought behind why they do that. Hmm. Um, yeah, I thought it's really unusual, but she's great in this. She's really good. Mm. She turns out to be a resistance fighter as well, doesn't she? She's sort of seeking to overthrow Kohagen. Yeah. She actually works really well with Arnie when they become like a team. You yeah. Know, like, uh, and they do it's a great dynamic. Scenes yeah. together. Yeah, yeah they've certainly got a good chemistry in that sequence where they're sort of, sort of tossing that, um, with that, that sort of hologram generator and sort yeah. of working as a team. That's sort of, yeah, real. Yeah, Fantastic. Yeah. I haven't really seen her in anything else of note. She's week. probably been around, but yeah, I haven't, yeah, haven't yeah. seen her in any other big movies. Yeah, have you, bros? Or? Well, apparently she pops up in Con Air and Falling Down, but uh, okay. she, not memorably. Not memorably. Fair enough. And she still does a little bit of acting right up until now, but nothing major, bit of TV work and bits and pieces, but yeah. The other big star from Total Recall, of yes. course, is none other than uh, Sharon Stone herself, who plays Laurie. <laughs> um, <laughs> I love that bit when he, when he realizes that his wife is like trying to attack him in the hotel room. Like, Laurie. Laurie. <laughs> 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 it's hilarious. No, um, Laurie, who's Quaid's seemingly loving wife, who is later revealed to be an agent sent by Cohagen to monitor Quaid. She's Richter's wife as well, is that yeah. right? She's shown to possess various martial arts skills. She's able to nearly fight Quaid to a standstill in some of the battles that they have. And also gives um, Melina a vicious beating as well. So she's not just another pretty face she actually Sharon Stone actually did quite a bit of training she's also yeah, a very she's a terrible shot when she's trying to shoot him when he's in the bathroom and misses him about 10 times <laughs> like just standing like a metre away from him yeah <laughs> and proficient with knives and firearms yeah yeah yeah, yeah. she makes I, don't, yeah. I don't know that sequence where she comes she's in the hotel room with Quaid and trying to convince him that it's yeah. all a dream or whatever why would he buy that from her because it's just it's really oh, bizarre i think let's get to that i think uh, yeah, I yeah, just, yeah. I, I, it's really unusual but yeah sharon Stein. this is kind of her biggest role up to this point this is kind of her big launch because yeah, this is when was basic instinct that's after it's this, uh, definitely it? after this yeah, yeah it's yeah. uh 90, 92 two years yeah. after this one yeah and so she'd been in like police academy four at this point she'd been in a couple other smaller budget films she shows up in action jackson and stuff like that <laughs> nice. but yeah. th- th- this is kind of her big kind of first big starring role to a degree and uh, and she's great in it she's really good yeah, yeah. I think she's really um, yeah, outstanding and, and also uh, when we first saw this movie as, as young men as well like she was just like a dream oh, woman she's, she's gorgeous so yeah yeah and just really yeah. this whole femme fatale role that, she, that she's got in this film like she's nasty yeah. she's a hard ass yeah, 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 Verhoeven yeah. Uh, Verhoeven jokes in the commentary about in that opening sequence where it's Arnold and Sharon in bed together and, he's, and he says oh Sharon didn't want to show anything here she didn't want to show any skin and they kind of have a bit of a, a chuckle about it and then Verhoeven just says <laughs> kind of throws away what was it? I made a pay for that in Basic yeah, yeah, Instinct. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shut everything. Yeah. <laughs> uh, very uh, funny. Bided his time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, only two years it took to break yeah. it down, apparently. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah, but Sharon Stone's great in this, yeah. in this role. Like, you know, uh, she, she does get killed probably about, what, two thirds of the way through the movie and that doesn't feature in the last act. She gets yeah. she gets divorced, I think you'll find Yeah, that. yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, fantastic. Uh, but um, yeah, no, she's fantastic. She's great. Ronnie Cox, who's a uh, Verhoeven stayer, plays Cohagen, who's like the corrupt and ruthless governor of the Mars colony. Yeah. Ronnie Cox, very famous for roles in Robocop and also Beverly Hills Cop. Yeah, Beverly Hills Cop as yeah. well. Ronnie Cox is just the definitive bad guy like is he yeah. you know like he's but just, just more villain. like the, the capitalist pig as well oh, he's yeah. just that like doesn't give a shit about anything summed other up, than himself summed up with this scene <laughs> with this scene that Michael and I have enjoyed for years in which like um, one of his uh, agents rings him up on the video phone and goes like sir the oxygen level is bottoming out in sector G what do you want me to do about it don't do anything but they won't last an hour sir fuck them a good lesson to the others. The uh, you know, <laughs> I, I actually um, 
<laughs> I wonder if that line was improvised too. It looks like it could Because it looks improvised. Yeah. It looks like he's done that a hundred times or whatever and he's yeah. just, just for his own entertainment, yeah. for this take, he's gone, yeah. ah, fuck him. Seriously. Because it's, like, so, it's so underplayed, that line. It's so funny. And just how, how, how sorry you feel for the fish when he just... In- oh, yeah. That is actually the, the saddest shot in the whole movie. Yeah. I didn't, did, I didn't notice the disclaimer at the end saying no animals were hurt though. What happened yeah, to those I fish? Know, I don't think I saw that either. Fish, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Oh, poor poor fish. I know, poor fish. Oh. <laughs> Which really worked really nicely when that sort of uh, cut to then a shot of the people running The people suffocating, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Clearly, but, um, yeah. But, you know, just moments like that, just, you know, when uh, Cohagen has his death out in the atmosphere of Mars and they have that extreme puppet head yeah. with, like, their eyes, like, <laughs> bulging out. Like, it's just, just exactly like, what you wanted yeah, to happen to Yeah, you wanted to happen to him. him. Those yeah, grotesque worst death possible. Whole and movie. Verhoeven lets us see all of it. Oh, yeah. There's the no outrageous. implied death. It's just, let's look at everything. Yeah. He's Big also... bulging eyes. I love how the tongue swells up. Oh, when yeah. <laughs> I don't quite understand the science of why your tongue would swell up, but I love it. I love it. You're dying in the most painful way yeah, possible. That's exactly Ronnie right. Cox is also responsible for probably the worst line in cinema history in this yes. film. In 30 seconds, you'll be dead. Then I'll blow this place up and be home in time for cornflakes. Yeah, what the hell is that? What does that mean? What the fuck does that mean? Why would you be back for cornflakes? <laughs> like, it, it's this is just... the worst line ever. <laughs> it is just... What does that mean? Cornflakes. Is there like a definitive time where you can have cornflakes? I like, don't know. It's, yeah, it's blowing bizarre. Blowing up an alien reactor. It's bizarre. Like, I, mean, I don't know. Like, what does it mean? I, I know that... I know that um, so Ronnie Cox <laughs> eats cornflakes for breakfast. Yeah. Schwarzenegger eats green berets, doesn't yeah. he? <laughs> 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 but you're right It's bread. really jarring yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's at the end Very pivotal yeah, moments pivotal Coming moment, up as well It's just like, the worst line Like I wonder if they had Did it again Yeah it's such a, It's a horrible like, line Like yeah. what were, Like was that an alternative Like were there yeah. other lines Like I'll be just Home time for know. I really yeah. like, yeah. I mean, When so much of the script Is so well thought out In this film Like how did they get in there Like it, I'll be home like, in time For cornflakes <laughs> Another one of my favourites, Michael Ironside plays Richter, Cohagen's chief lieutenant. Did uh, Michael Ironside ever have hair? <laughs> like, he's got one of the worst comb-over. Like, he's got the worst comb-over in the history of cinema. <laughs> like, at one point, there's a shot of the back of his head. It's like, wow, that is intricate. That is, he spent time on that. So, he, he relentlessly tries to kill Quaid, despite Cohagen's repeated insistence that Quaid yeah. is to be captured, not killed. Is this just because he's super jealous about Laurie? Yeah, and that, I, yeah I, of course. I think yeah. obviously they've worked out into the story that, that Laurie's his wife, so that's, that really gives him incentive to, um, yeah. you know, to, and to just, kill him. Just that typical thing as well, like when Cohagen is trying to tell him, you, you listen to me, you keep him alive, and he just goes like, he's, he, you know, he starts affecting with the, with the uh, signal. So it's yeah, like, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, losing yeah, yeah. you, I can't hear you. That's very funny, that moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But he's just so yeah. mean, and he takes joyous pleasure out of being mean. There's like bones in the film where you see him sort of smile to himself. He just loves being an asshole. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Particularly when he, when he shoots um, Mary, the uh, three-breasted prostitute. In yeah. the back. Oh, in the back. Oh, yeah, just, just yeah. right there and then. Yeah. Which is one of the most... That, that scene where all hell breaks loose in oh, uh, yeah. the strip joint is... Uh, <laughs> it's a golden just, scene. That, that's gold. <laughs> just random people getting in the way and then Verhoeven shows you, get, you know, them with a big just, squib going off. Like, oh, you know, yeah. Like, you know another yeah. great moment? And it might be Ironside that fires the bullet. When Schwarzenegger breaks the window on the train and then jumps into the train, the train's pulling off and Ironside or Richter's just firing randomly at the train. And if you look really closely, there's a woman standing in the window or in the door of one of the other carriages and he shoots and then she falls down. Oh, I haven't seen and that And you can before. barely even I see it. It's like a small actually, little moment. So in she the, does get shot. He kills she, her. Yeah. <laughs> And you can't even tell. Like, it's yeah, only because yeah, I watched yeah. the Blu-ray and it was on the, I was, you know, the big TV and everything. I could, I could see that detail, but no one, you can't, like, oh. why would you put that in? It's so <laughs> horrible. It's like, bang, 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 miss, 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 bang. Oh, I shot an innocent person. Oh, well. Oh, but there's so much collateral damage <laughs> so in this film. Oh, yeah. People are getting it. shot all over the place. There'd be like, more. That guy in the escalator, as we talked about, he's just the ultimate and just wrong place, wrong time. <laughs> also, some of the, um, the scientists or the, uh, the oh. assistants in the scene. <laughs> oh, yeah. Where, Arnie with the, and, uh, uh, the weird, the, the, on his wrist, the, uh. Oh, yeah, it sticks it right in the guy's yeah, neck, and there's know. a pole or whatever that he just shoves through that guy's head like oh, you know. out of his nose <laughs> I really like that moment where he shoves it off camera and all you see is it still standing there off the yeah. side of the camera. That's nice. And then they do the reverse shot of it, which is, this, I don't think that's quite as fun. This film has some great screams as well. Like, you know, just the scream. I mean, so many people die. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, you know, just hilarious ones like when the um, the windows in the uh, the complex get, like, breached and, like, you know, the atmosphere starts, and people getting sucked out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just some of the guys just going fly out the window, like, scream yeah. like, with massive... They add this echo effect. <laughs> Yeah. 
don't know why the <laughs> echo. <bit>. Yeah, <laughs> there's there's no atmosphere. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There shouldn't be. Yeah, it's, it's hilarious. But um, yeah, but what do you think of Michael Ironside? I think he's great in this. He's menacing. He's ruthless. He even gets a little bit hurt later on when he finds out that he's just a pawn in uh, Cohagen's game. But he does, um, yes. And I love how he gets a bit upset that, that Laurie might actually be more attracted to Quaid than he is. Oh, yeah. yeah. What does his friend say? I want that fucker dead. I don't blame him, man. I wouldn't want a guy like Quaid porking my old lady. You saying she likes it? No, I'm sure she hated every minute of it. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Just to sit him off. <laughs> That guy, that guy as well. He's, he's a classic. He's a typical henchman guy. I don't know yeah, what the actor's yeah, name yeah. is, but he's popped up in quite a lot of things yeah. as well. Normally roles like that. Yeah, like that. Well. And there's the funniest death as well with the, um, the, 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 um, the, the dwarf girl the uh, stabs him in the guts. <laughs> Really violent, <laughs> really tough. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Are there any other members of the supporting cast that you want to you want to bring up at all? Or? I don't know. Just the other thing with Michael Ironside, the only the only moment which is a bit softer is drinking like looks like strawberry big M in the bar. Yeah, that's you know? so weird, isn't it? <laughs> it's really not a jar. And there's a there's a beer there's a light sign beer behind sign them. Behind yeah, and they're drinking, drinking strawberry big M. <laughs> So, and they're both drinking it. It's Could bizarre. Have been drinking a beer or something. Like, this is a hard ass. He's drinking milk. <laughs> I wonder if that was a uh, Michael Ironside choice. Yeah. Like, you know, like, I'm going to drink it's this like instead. Or yeah. mm. These aren't any one of note, but the characters, though. Uh, Mel Johnson Jr. plays Benny, the taxi driver and mutant oh, yeah. on the Mars colony who befriends Quaid, but later betrays them and the mutants to Cohagen. Yeah. Um, Benny is a classic. Yeah, he's We're talking great. about funny he's... moments. Like, Benny, <laughs> Benny's full of them. Mm, like... mm, mm, baby, make me wish I had three hands. <laughs> Which One. is ironic because yeah. he does have three yeah, hands. Yeah, well, he does. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but, the, uh, I hadn't have thought of that. Yeah. Benny's the name of the cab in Who Framed Roger Rabbit as well, though, isn't yeah. it? Well, what's the deal with Benny as a cab driver's yeah, name? Yeah, I think it's, it's just, just like, you think about it, Benny the cab driver just seems to work. Yeah. It works for you. Like, okay. it, does. it does. How many real chat listeners that drive cabs are named Benny? Yeah. That's, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Call us. And actually, uh, another member of the supporting cast, just quickly, is I think uh, Dean Norris, who plays, I think his name's Tony, the guy with the, the big scar on his face in the bar. Um, oh, the he's from uh, uh, to Breaking the Bad. He's in Breaking Bad. Um, who, who I didn't recognise him at all. He, he shot to fame in Breaking Bad, and but he's, he's in... also in Terminator 2. He's um, one of the SWAT team SWAT, people. Yeah, he is too. Yeah. yeah. So you said that brief period of being Arnie films, sort of in 1991. Yeah, that brief period of being Bill Pullman. Yeah, yeah. And then. <laughs> <laughs> and then we forgot about him until uh, Breaking Bad. He obviously made it to fame, and then he was in uh, what is it, the shit show, the Dome, under the isn't Dome, it? Under and, the uh, yeah, in the Dome, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, but, um, and also um, Robert Costanzo, who plays Harry Quaid's workmate, who's revealed to be an agent sent by <laughs> yeah, Quaid. He's oh, Rico, Rico. <laughs> <laughs> One of the best lines. He also in the film. has one of the great deaths uh, when when there's that fight scene and he gets his <laughs> in the um, train station. His there. neck, his you know he's on the ground and and Arnie puts his foot on his neck. You know that crack sound yeah. that you hear? Do you know how some of the bone crunching sounds were created in this film? How? Celery sticks. Oh really? The bone crunching... I don't think I've ever heard bone crunching... That scene in particular, the crunching... Like Total Recall's bone crunching sounds like that. It's something else. <laughs> it really is. It's something but else. Just, uh, what, what, at what ease Arnie disposes of people's necks? He just sort of stands at this guy's head and like... <laughs> <laughs> he just like breaks everybody's neck in that scene. It's just incredible. The sound designer must have had a ball. Yeah. On this. Uh, 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 there are so many great scenes in Total Recall. What are some of some of your favourites, guys? I really like the Quato scene. Uh, uh, um, Open like your mind the, scene. Yeah, the, I great. guess the reveal of Quato as sort of that, that parasitic twin of that other guy. That, that, that could have been really disappointing. Too. Yeah, it could have been terrible. Like, like, I, and, and even now, the puppet prosthetic thing's not. It's not great. It's not great, but but, yeah. but it's really yeah. powerful. Yeah, yeah, they 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 use it properly there. I think. Yeah, yeah. and um, it's just that, that whole sequence where he sort of opens his mind and sort of goes does that fly through of the of the of the reactor and re- particularly the music in that oh, scene, yeah. which yeah. We'll, we'll get to um, yeah. later down the track. But it just it, all together, that scene's fantastic. I was going to say that too. Yeah, the open your mind scene was the, the yeah. one I had listed as well. Uh, what, what about yourself, bro? It's, it's not a major thing, but I do love the TV commercials that Verhoeven does in his films. And I love the recall ad and then the fly to Mars, the old fashioned way kind of ad. And I love that stuff. I love his sleazy sales pitch kind of guys. And The recall jingle is really good as well. Yeah, we might recall, actually play recall, that for recall. you right now.
Yes. So, no, it's, it's, you're right, though, bros. Yeah. yeah I love the way he does that. that. Yeah. It's, it's, it's great stuff. So we will get on to... I, I do want to spend just, you know, the main discussion about this movie. I just want to talk about the implication because the movie obviously has the, you know... Is it a dream? Is it not a dream? Yeah. Right? But just quickly, the differences between the book and the film, okay? Um, one the big difference that I was able to gather, because I haven't read it. Have you read it, bros? No. No. Um, is that the book is very serious, and obviously the film is an entertaining is. action Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. What's surprising about We Can Remember It For You Wholesale is how close it is to Total Recall, just difference yeah. in tone, right? So both the story and the movie follow Douglas Quayle, an everyday married guy who is inexplicably drawn to Mars, realizing that he'll never be able to go to the planet in person. Quaid visits the offices of Recall, Incorporated, where he elects to undergo a process that will insert the memories of a trip to Mars into his brain, a trip where he adopts the role of a secret agent. The trouble is, before the process can even begin, Recall's technicians discover that those memories already exist in Quain's mind. He is a secret agent and he did go to Mars. Having now remembered his other life, Quaid finds himself pursued by shadowy secret security forces intent on killing him. Where the short story in the movie part ways is directly after this point, right? So in the film, Quaid heads off to Mars and gets involved in a Martian revolution. All of that was bolted on to Dick's story by Verhoeven and his writers. Okay. Dick's tale ends with Quayle striking a deal. He returns to recall voluntarily <laughs> to avoid being killed, agreeing to have his mind once again wiped, and having one of his outlandish fantasies implanted as a memory, overriding the secret agent Mars One. Quayle will receive memories of having saved Mars from an alien invasion when he was a child. This leads to a nice twist that's even more insane than what's gone before. When the recall technicians try to implement this memory, they find that he has already and generally experienced this as a child. Yeah. But although the story and the movie diverge here, prior to this juncture, they run along remarkably similar lines right down to the robot taxis. Oh, really? Yeah, that's the, that's the big key differences that I was able to... <clears throat> yeah to find I'd, I'd really like to read this yeah yeah I think, we, I think we've got to get our hands on it <laughs> definitely so anyway the big part that I just want to discuss here is the implication of this movie because this film other than the odd hint here and there it doesn't ever say one way or the other about whether or no, not no and that's the beauty of the film it, that's can't, the beauty of yeah, it, it has it? to be open to interpretation do you think so bros I don't think this film's open to as much interpretation as people are forcing upon it really yeah what really? makes you say that yeah I'd Look, it can be read that way that it's a dream, but I don't think that's how the film plays out. And Verhoeven has implied that that's not the way he intended it at all anyway. Um, Verhoeven said once Schwarzenegger was cast in it, that element of the film pretty much gets dropped and it becomes the reality of the film is the reality. I thought Whereas he said he that left, it was a dream. He left a couple of moments in where it could be read that way, but in the commentary as well, he kind of makes it sound like he's he sick of all dream. the... No, he, he said he's pretty much sick of all the dream talk and he's quite happy to follow it as well. Oh, here reality. we go. We've got a bit of division here in the team. I, I don't think, know. <laughs> I've watched the commentary in the last 24 hours. I don't know how recently you <laughs> watched that. Yeah. I, 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 yeah. I thought yeah. that in the, in the... You want it to be a dream, though. That's the other thing about you two. I think you like the idea no, of no, it being don't. dualistic. I'm a realist. Yeah, yeah. I want it to be the other way around. Yeah, yeah. I think I think the the dream elements that could the evidence for the dream elements are so subtle and underplayed yeah, I think that, that I think we need to I don't think they exist these, but it, yeah I think it, it has to be open to interpretation so, it can be open I just yeah. don't think it's there so yeah. what kind of uh, little points Michael you know you say you want it to be reality but what yeah. are some of the little hints that the film gives you that jumps out to you which make or, or why do you sort of swing that way okay I guess so the film is more satisfying if you take it in the context that it's real because Often movies that are just built entirely out of a dream sequence aren't very satisfying because they're a bit pointless. Um, there are some good ones, but um, and this being one of them. But yeah, it's more satisfying to think, yeah, that there is a you know a very complicated plot you know unfolding here, and I think just that plot itself is worth discussing because if you actually delve into what Cohagen's plot is, it is very harebrained and complicated. You know, assuming this is real, this is what's happened. Cohagen and Hauser are obviously. They're best friends. Yep. Um, they're, they're running this corporation on Mars. They need to destroy this Martian resistance. It's, um, it's you know, about to undermine their corporation. However, they can't just put a double agent in to, um, to find and kill Quado and destroy the rebels because, uh, as he says, the mutants always sniff them out. They, they're, they're psychic. And if a, a double agent goes consciously knowing that he's there to, to kill Quado, they, they see that, you know, that they can spot that out. So they needed an infiltrator that was going in with the very best intentions, unaware of the fact that he was actually you know, going in there to, 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 to undermine the rebels. So they create this really plausible backstory where Hauser is um, 
he's changing teams, that he's you know, going against Gohagen and that he's going to side with the Rebels and, uh, and re- reveal to them confidential information and, and, uh, which they'll use to sort of bring down the corporation. But they don't just convince the Rebels of that. Gohagen convinces all of his own people that. All of his goons are led to believe that same story. So they've, they've spent like a year developing this backstory... Then the clincher is to convince everyone of this. Obviously, uh, Hauser has gone and sort of befriended Milena and the rebels and that, and um, and they believe that he's you know about to side with them. Then they wipe Hauser's memory and send him to Earth and put him under surveillance to continue to convince not the rebels but Cohagen's people that this is what's happening. That yeah. Hauser has turned against yeah. um, the corporation. Now, at some point, Hauser, sorry, Quaid, which is now you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger's new persona, is meant to be activated, as, as Cohagen refers to later on, and to see this footage of Hauser telling him that you know, Hauser was turning against the, the corporation and siding with the rebels and that he has some information that, that needs to be unlocked from his memory, which causes him then to go to, to Mars, seek out the rebels seek out Quarter, who can't sniff him out because he's yeah, going in with the very best intentions has no idea that he's actually a bad guy which mm-hmm. then leads um, leads them to Quarter, which then allows um, them to catch Quarter in the end but that's it's a very complicated plot and um, the, the interesting thing is and I only picked up the this time viewing it he wasn't meant to go to recall like I always set, thought that was supposed to trigger this sort of this sequence of events occurring but I just noticed there's a throwaway line that Ronnie Cox says as a co- Cohagen he says um, you pop your memory cap before we can activate you Richter goes hog wild screwing up everything I spent a year planning frankly I'm amazed it worked so he was, beha- he was amazed that the whole thing worked so he actually wasn't meant to go to recall that, that, that sort of triggered everything early and um, and they had to sort of you know save the situation the best they could. So I wonder what was supposed to happen. You know, it was Could fascinating. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they, they, they obviously, you were supposed well, to spend more time on Earth, and then they were supposed to sort of you know you know make these things go into play, and then you were supposed to get that suitcase with the footage of Hauser telling him what happened, and then it was supposed to be I guess a bit more controlled. But uh, definitely, yeah. and this is just one of those big things that you you pick up more information on yeah. the viewings of this movie as well. Look, my feeling with the dream stuff is that that's just something Verhoeven's put in because there's an opening for it and it's just to mess with viewers minds i I, I don't think verhoeven had any intention of saying this was ever a dream and i don't know it's just it's it's adding an extra layer of depth there are a couple of key scenes that indicate it might be a dream right and the big closing obviously is there but yeah the the, the closing scene is there to fuck with people's minds there's no question about that and And then there's a to white at the end the fade to white yeah Yeah. i mean it's just verhoeven you know being a smart ass it's not even to me that's not enough evidence that indicates it is a dream or isn't a dream it does frustrate me that uh, the line is something like hurry up and kiss me before you wake up or whatever and then he still takes three minutes to kiss yeah. it <laughs> the, um, which indicates to me that it's not a dream I, I get that it's an overly complex plot and it's easier to explain it away in a dream than it to be exactly yeah, it's like very hairbrained plot but, but that's alright that's, that's part of the yeah, that's that part is, of the commentary yeah, that he's making yeah. about uh, totalitarianism as well though that's yeah. the yeah. and uh, Cohagen says himself he only gives enough information out that you need and don't think yeah. like, just, there are other films that I would spend more time thinking about whether it's a dream or reality or not whereas this one the dream stuff to me seems like an afterthought and, and something that the you know the writer might have thrown at him on set rather than something that was written intricately into the, the plot because it doesn't feel an intricate part of this story is whether it's a dream or not that oh, doesn't seem I don't know I differ I think it's, it's to very me it much an intricate part of this plot and I mean there's other things that sort of lead up to him sort of sitting in the chair that sort of give away the story I mean that, that character Bob McLean that's at recall pretty much says to him you know you're gonna you're gonna kill the baddies you know get the girl and save the entire planet which is you know exactly what happens really yeah. Yeah. When, he, when he picks the um, the ego trip as the um, as the secret agent, um, and even uh, when he's sitting in the chair, and the technician says to him, when he's sitting in the chair, he looks at some file, goes, blue sky, blue sky on and Mars. Mars. That's a new one, you know. So there's yeah, yeah there's there's little things in there which indicate pretty much what was going to unfold uh, in this movie. Definitely, and there's, there's numerous moments uh, in the film as well where you're actually given the entire movie and the ending. Yep. Through in the course of the movie, yeah, moments yeah, like yeah. what you just said, yeah, like, pretty you know, much. They, they summed up the film. And even though you you might sort of go, oh, that's interesting, yeah, you don't actually think about it that much until you go back and revisit it and see exactly what they said, yeah, yeah, give, yeah. You'll give away everything. Like if you then look at it as is this movie a dream? There's actually two interpretations of this as well. So is this a dream? So from when he moment he sits in the chair, he's receiving 100 percent the implanted. You know, memory that um, that that recall giving him. So, 
it just plays out as they implanted, or is he experiencing um, what they refer to in this film as the the schizoid embolism? Uh, not not, the, a, not a real medical term. Yeah, not a real medical term, <laughs> but uh, something invented in this film to say that the the, the procedure's gone wrong, and he's sort of experiencing this like a, what they call a free form delusion, where he's he's not accepting the memories they're implanting, he's rejecting his old memories, but he's sort of creating things up. As he goes along, and that's sort of what that that scene where that Doctor Edgemar, the um the, the recall guy, comes into the room, tries to explain to him, and and I guess you you sort of say, oh well, he you know that was just part of the dream that was implanted, or that was reality, and he was actually trying to give him a pill to kill him. Maybe the other interpretation is what this was actually he was having a schizoembolism, and he is creating this all up in his head. That scene with Doctor Edgemar as well is really integral as well because it's one moment in the movie where it really slows down and starts yeah. to explain exactly what's going on in this crazy Verhoeven movie. You yeah, know? yeah, so yeah. There's a lot of tension in that scene. If you look at that scene as well, actually going back to the start, the, the other thing that, uh, it's an interesting theory that he's having this sort of delusion and, and that's not part of the implant is things that he's told before getting the implant actually play into the film. So when the, um, the Bob McLean, the guy at Recall, says to him, A real holiday is a pain in the butt. You got lost luggage, lousy weather, crooked taxi drivers. When you travel with Recall... Everything is perfect. However, when he goes into his recall holiday, let's say it is a dream, all these things do happen. Exactly. He, uh, you know, you got the uh, the woman trying to steal his luggage, lousy weather, shit. There's like massive blow stores coming into the into the Mars facility, or people getting sucked yep. out. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, crooked cab drivers. It's full of them. I mean, you got you got Johnny Cab, sorry, trying to blow him up, and then Benny the cab driver plays a massive role in the film. So, it's like all the experiences that form, you know, his life up to that point, watching the news, seeing Cohagen on the news, the things people tell him are sort of creating this delusion in his head. Yeah. And then the sequence with Dr. Edgemar, that we, Dr. Edgemar is saying he's in the recall um, suite, sort of tapping into his neural whatever, like he's sort of talking to him and he's got the wife there, Laurie, as well, trying to talk to him sort of through, um, through recall, trying to snap him out of his dream. What does he say? The Dr. Edgemar says, oh, the walls of reality will come crashing down. Now, you know, one moment you'll be the uh, leader of the resistance, the next you'll be um, going against bosom, buddy. So all those things he says happen as well. Yeah, and I actually, the moment, <laughs> the moment he stops talking and, and he kills that doctor, the, the walls do come crashing down. All the people come through them. <laughs> Literally so, come crashing down. So, so um, yeah. it all, it's a plausible theory as well. It's a, it's a second dream theory. I, yeah. I like the way that it sort of really just goes right down the middle and says, that, yeah. like, you know, if you want to think of the movie this way, you're going to have yeah. as much fun or if you can think of the movie yeah. this way you know so and the other way that just the, the standard implant dream doesn't work you know the, the idea is you have a recall dream and you sort of wait come to and everything you should believe all those sort of memories but in, you know in this dream he's just killed his wife he's killed his best friend at work he's you know <laughs> he's done all these crazy things he's gonna go back home and say hey Laurie you know nice knowing you like you yeah. know like uh, which sort of doesn't make sense whereas if he's having that free form delusion it sort of maybe makes more sense so I don't oh know. definitely yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it's not really- for me <laughs> Bruce Have you got I, anything to add to that, bros? Uh, yeah. We're still here, bros. <laughs> <laughs> Any other cast members you want to highlight <laughs> from this film, Adam? Uh, yeah. What do you think of this film, bros? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't think this much about it, I can tell you. Look, it's, it's a nice, clever technique from Verhoeven to create a bit extra depth to a film that, that could easily be pushed aside and like I said I think Verhoeven just likes fucking with audiences so I don't, I don't think he has any intention of this being a dream and he, he said once he cast Schwarzenegger the Schwarzenegger fans don't want it to be a dream they want it to be a reality and so he's quite happy to let people you know continue along that path he's never really said either way honestly and he also has said he put that dream sequence in at the end or the, the fade to white to leave it ambiguous and mess with people a bit more so he, he's having a lot of fun and being very playful with it and I don't think he really cares either way it's just yeah. you know a lot of action sequences a bit like when we're talking about Fury Road a lot of action sequences in this film a lot of set pieces a lot of fight sequences he had a lot of downtime on set just to sit around and think up ways to fuck with our heads so yeah. and he's done that and I like it like you said all the different references to bits and pieces come true and that's either really clever writing or indicates that there's a dream or, or reality element uh, either way you want to look at it so it's, it's great it makes the film so much more interesting all yeah. of a sudden you made mention of the Johnny Cab as well Michael before don't you love the way I mean I think this is what's implied with Johnny Cab is that if you um, you know if you don't pay the fare and you say something on the lines of sue me dickhead like that <laughs> and Johnny Cab tries to run you down and kill you is that is that what it's just the violent future that they're in the it's <laughs> If you don't pay it your fare, like <laughs> it'll try and run you down and then explode. That's right. So. And that's fair. I think that's fair. Yeah, I think, yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> followed up by that great sequence as well where, you know, Hauser on the on the video monitor is, you know, talking to Quaid. That's Arnie's another great. example Arnie's of where right Arnie's, Arnie's well. acting is amazing. Yeah, and he, and yeah. he does seem like a completely different character and he's very yeah. charismatic. And yeah, those video bits are just phenomenal. He's so, so well shot. Yeah. So well performed. <clears throat> Particularly I when he watches the video with the reveal that he is yeah, working for with Co-Hagen. Co-Hagen. Yeah, and the look on Quaid's face, yeah. realisation. And then Arnie's line like, you know, like, Perhaps we meet in our dreams. You never know. <laughs> you never know. You never know. <laughs> like, it's fantastic. But it's interesting that, I mean, like before we said about Cohagen, his first name is Vilos. Vilos Cohagen. Like, yeah, his Vilos. name is Villain, pretty much. Like, yeah. you do like, get the sense that they are, like, really close, like Cohagen and Hauser, because he actually pains him at the end to give the order to, to have him killed. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah the, it also yeah, helps which, explain why he's reluctant to kill him all the yeah, way through. Yeah, that's he, right. Even though the, you know, whatever the brain-altering technology they're using obviously isn't great. Yeah. And he still doesn't, you know, it's, he still wants to keep trying that. Yeah. So deep down there, he's got a small little black heart somewhere, you know. <laughs> like, it's, it's just a little bit of trivia here from Total Recall. Uh, this is one of the last major Hollywood blockbusters to make large-scale use of miniature effects. Yeah. Uh, as which, uh, which, 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 which is a nonsense sentence anyway, because films are still using miniatures. They just use them in a different way. And miniature workshops have more work now than they did in the pre-CGI period anyway. So quite often what happens now is instead of creating miniatures and shooting them as live, they create the miniatures and then they'll sh- scan them in and use them as models to then create the backdrops in CGI. So this is the last one to shoot them as practical effects as opposed to using them to then inform the CGI. Do you like the practical element. effects in this film? In this film, it looks phenomenal. It's aged. Yeah. The effects have aged really well and there's some little tricks and gags they do all the way through that just give it so much more credibility than you would even think. Like the the great one is the train travelling across Mars yeah. Yeah. and we start with in the train with the two guys talking, Schwarzenegger and the other guy, and then the camera pulls out and we see them in the window. They did a little, They put a little projector inside the train, shot the film into the window of the train so that when the camera pulled back, there was actually the image of the tr- in the in the in the window as they pulled out. I like so, that. It's really good. And it's just really clever, really smart stuff. Massive, massive sets that they built. But the the visual effects in this film, the practical effects, are phenomenal. I'm not quite sure why all the cars in Total Recall look like DeLoreans from Back oh, to the Future, and why golf wings are so it's popular. Cheap looking as well. I know they're just like the, the nasty looking <laughs> model <laughs> kit looking things. Just a crumple zone on a they're made, zone. I think they're made out of cardboard. I don't know what. They're... And yeah, no, I, I wish golf wings had have been a hit in the future. Yeah, I wish yeah, all yeah. cars had those wing doors. Like the DeLorean, that'd, that'd be nice, wouldn't it? I think, uh, I think the most dated effects Give in this time. film um, are probably just some of the puppet heads, oh, really. Yeah, like like the, although the, the puppet heads phenomenally better compared to Terminator. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, they, they are. are. Yeah. They're, they're a little bit jarring. The classic yeah. two week scene when Arnie dresses yeah. up with, with, as the big woman, which you know, is like, really a bizarre scene, isn't it? Like, it's, it's so it's bizarre. Really, and w- also way weirder than the rest of the film. Yeah, and and doesn't doesn't even make really all that much sense yeah. as to why it's there or why it fails or yeah. like I don't, I don't understand how that yeah it's bizarre yeah. but um, yeah but yeah that, that shot of Arnie's head obviously when he takes the mask off and it sort of appears above his head and you just sort of quickly see and then come back to a different angle and there's Arnie standing there it doesn't yeah, look much yeah. like it yeah, and yeah. also I mean the, the other one which isn't as bad as that one is when he's pulling the thing out of his nose like the, oh yeah and that's, I reckon uh, that yeah. puppet head looks pretty yeah, good yeah it's, it's pretty good that, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, I like it's that still, it's obviously a puppet head now but it's, it's pretty good it, yeah. it's, it still looks generally painful so that's it that, yeah. That's showing that the effects are pretty, yeah. are pretty good. But I know and then yeah. Schwarz- yeah. Schwarzenegger off camera going, ah, 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 ah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is the same noise he makes when you ask him to spell his last name. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. After seeing Sharon Stone's performance as Laurie in this movie, director Paul Verhoeven would cast her in the movie Basic Instinct due to her ability to play a character that could change from a timid, charming sweetheart to a diabolical person and back again at a moment's notice. He also states that this is basically the way Sharon Stone is in real life. Apparently, is a bit of a dig. Turn it up. Well, there you so, go. <laughs> I know. So, all of the crew fell ill due to food poisoning during production. Except? Arnold Schwarzenegger and Ronald Schusett. Correct. <laughs> Schwarzenegger escaped because he always had his food catered from the US. Oh, of course. But this- apparently, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger's chef got sick. <laughs> So the chef wasn't allowed to so eat the his own food. Chef wasn't eating Arnie's food. <laughs> the chef was Mexican food. <laughs> <laughs> He's having tacos. That's horrible, <laughs> isn't it? He is. Cooking he ice. just couldn't refuse burrito day. <laughs> <laughs> This was because three years earlier he had fallen ill due to drinking tap water in Mexico during production of Predator. As for Shusett, he took extreme health precautions, such as only brushing his teeth with bottled, bottled water, water yeah. and insisting on getting a weekly vitamin B12 shot. 
Shusett was even mocked by the crew until they all got sick. Oh, so cool. um, he was onto it, yeah, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah, and they yeah, would have yeah. kept mocking him too, but it's hard to mock when you're vomiting. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> In the DVD commentary, Paul Verhoeven said that for the love scene after Quaid wakes up from his nightmare, which is hilarious, by the way, it has one of those movie moments where someone who has a nightmare literally sits up. Yeah, yeah. You know, like they, oh, they yeah, yeah, ah! yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he like, gets out, like sits up. And, yeah, um, cliche, which I, isn't it? Has <laughs> ever had a nightmare and actually done that? Yeah. Like, no. You know, like, so, um, I do like, though, in, the, in that yeah. particular sequence, Arnold Schwarzenegger is covered in sweat as well because yeah, well. you do you know that's yeah. often when you're having a nightmare you'll, you'll end up sweating so that was yeah. kind of a nice touch did you guys know that Johnny Cab whistles the Norwegian national anthem <laughs> no <laughs> that's what he's whistling that. oh that's awesome <laughs> yeah. where am I you're in a Johnny Cab I mean what am I doing uh, here I'm sorry. Would you please rephrase the question? Huh? How did I get in this taxi? The door opened. You got in. <laughs> Hell of a day, isn't it? I love that, <laughs> I love that scene. I just love yeah. that moment of Johnny Cab as well when he like flits his eyelids. Door open. You got in. He goes, <laughs> and he like sort of like he like raises his eyelids to himself. Like, <laughs> like I made a funny. He's like, <laughs> or like you know, that's ridiculous. <laughs> it's, so funny. it's great. A couple of little things as well. A VHS copy of this film, bro, from back in the day, apparently mentions on the back cover that that's never happened since, that this film takes place in 2084. Ah, is it not in the film? It doesn't no. mention that anyway. Okay. No, not a thing. So, but Somehow it, I knew that year, but I must have just read it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so this, yeah. this is all we've got to go on. Yeah, so a little bit of trivia there from Total Recall. It's come out many, many times over the years, bros. One of these big reissue DVD and Blu-ray releases, Total Recall. Yeah. Come out numerous times. Started out in the early days, very bare bones, nothing on it, crap transfer, crap sound. Uh, and then that got reissued as a special edition. And then in 2006, bros, it got its uh, initial Blu-ray release. Early days of Blu-ray, so it wasn't great. Didn't have anything on it. But I know we've both got, bros, the Ultimate Recall Edition. R-E-K-A-L-L. -L, yep. Recall. Which came recall. out in 2012, which is probably the best. It's version. pretty tasty. Yeah, I was really impressed. I picked it up last minute because I haven't seen this film for ages. So I picked it up re um, at JB last minute. Got some good stuff um, on it. And yeah, it's solid. The, and the extras are really good. The um, behind the scenes stuff's really good. So tell us about the commentary. Now, the commentary is iconic for being one of only two audio commentaries that the man Schwarzenegger's ever done. Schwarzenegger's ever done. The other one being Conan the Barbarian. What do you think, Bryce? Yeah, it's not dissimilar to Conan in that Schwarzenegger, there's a good reason he hasn't done commentaries, because he literally commentates the film that he's in. He's like, oh, wait for this bit. Oh, this is funny. Oh, look at that. Yeah, oh, now I'm going to do this, and now I'm going to do that. And the reason I'm doing this is because it's like, we know we're know, watching I'm the watching film. right now. And the inference that I'm watching the commentary is that I've already watched the film before. I don't <laughs> need you to tell me what's happening. Verhoeven is better in that he has lots of little bits of trivia and bits and pieces all the way through it. So Verhoeven is tolerable. And the energy between Verhoeven and Schwarzenegger is great. They're obviously mates. They obviously get along really well. They obviously enjoyed shooting the film. So that stuff comes across. It, it's not a spectacular commentary. And I actually found there's two uh, making of featurettes. There's probably more in those than you're going to get out of the commentary. The commentary is a bit sparse, but every now and then Verhoeven, Verhoeven pulls out a, a gem. So only the hardcoreist of fans should watch. Have you watched it? The commentary? Yeah. Yes. Adams, have you watched the commentary? Uh, a long time ago. Yeah. yeah. I just and remember Verhoeven talking about blood and guts. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's, just, he's just quite comical himself. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the the, the dueling Dutch versus Austrian accents, yeah. is, it's worth listening to just oh, yeah. for that. Oh, if yeah. yeah. If you're a big fan. There's a bit of entertainment value out of that. The, uh, yeah, and only hardcore fans, I'd recommend watching it. If you've yeah. not listened to the commentary and you love this film, get onto it because it, it is entertaining enough. But for anyone else, I wouldn't bother. It's about a three-star commentary, two it's, and a half. Yeah, but the, the Blu-ray is worth picking up, though. The Blu-ray is phenomenal. Got some, it's got really, really good documentaries. Some of them half an hour long. Yeah, know. there's a, there's a half hour one and a twenty-three minute one of the two that I watched, and and yep. they were great. They were fantastic. And talking to everybody, all the practical effects guys, the CGI guys. This is one of the earliest instances of CGI in a feature film, and it's the X-ray skeleton stuff. It's, it's really fascinating and the guy who did the CGI says at one point it's like it's kind of embarrassing now because what we did and we maxed out these computers and pushed them as hard as we could and this is how many people and how long it took and you know you can do it in half a day now yeah. with the computer I've got on my desk you know so <laughs> yeah it's kind of hit it, cool to hear his perspective and, and to, you know to, to find out how much effort they put in and how they did what they did to, to make that stuff happen so it's, it's really good now the composer now, I, I can't believe that we're in episode 35 and we haven't looked at a movie scored by Jerry Goldsmith. Yeah. Yeah. It's quite incredible, actually. Jerry Goldsmith is just 
one of the legends of, of film music. It's as simple as that. You know, well, TV and film music. 136 music department credits. He personally considered this one of his best scores. I personally consider Jerry Goldsmith's Total Recall to be one of the best film scores ever made. In yeah, my opinion. I, I, th- I think it's a fair call. It's it is, one of my it favorite, amazing. <laughs> it's one of my favorite film scores and one of the, you know, how perfect it is in the movie. Yeah. Just as perfect as a listening experience, which very rarely happens other than some of the greats. Yeah. Right? Total Recall is just on a whole other level, in my opinion. And when it got expanded and got re-released and they released the entire score rather than just one of those like highlight albums yeah. like it originally came out as yeah I was over the moon yeah, there's, wrapped there's so much to this score isn't there I mean just even just the opening sequence that, that, that theme is it's, it's awesome like it's uh, it almost reminds you of the Conan <laughs> opening actually yeah, it's full of crumb the, 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 yeah, yeah you know what it's, it's inspired so by similar it's inspired but it's just it. that real sort of foreboding just real grand opening and then that theme then plays out through sort of quiet themes through you know other parts of the film sort of just more just dramatic sequences the actual sort of main theme of the movie and then there's a whole sort of Martian element as well sort of th- the movie those sort of synthesizer yeah, sort of uh, Martian sounds I don't know how to, how to yeah, describe yeah. them it's been yeah. commended for its blend of electronic and orchestral elements and yeah. that's one of the things that I love about it because yeah. I love electronic scores I love you know orchestral scores there's a time and place for them both yeah. this film just like you know goes right down the middle and says you know what there's a place for both and this is how you do it Yeah. and you know every single scene it pops up in it's used perfectly Yeah. and particularly the scene that we spoke about as one of our highlight scenes in the movie the sweeping, like you know, strings and and horns and everything that's used during that sequence, where you're, you know, you're, you're you've sort of gone into a Quaid's mind, haven't you? Yeah. And you're seeing the complex and all those visual effects shots. The open your mind. Oh, it's, it's, a, it's an amazing <laughs> you know, piece of music. That's for anyone listening. Called the Mutant on on the soundtrack, I yeah. believe is the name of the track. Yeah, it's and, the uh, highlight. It is incredible. Yep, yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah, Bruce. What do you think? What do you think of the score of Total Recall? Yeah, I love it. And we've talked about it before, you, you, as you were just saying there, the combination of electronic and, and acoustic instruments sometimes can be really problematic. Yep. Uh, but they, the, the Jerry Goldsmith's work here, he gets the, the balance is just spot on and perfect. It, it creates these really intense kind of moods and situations, and there's no solid, I guess, melodic theme to the to this work, but there are a lot of instrumental kind of themes that are you know different instruments that do recur throughout that create themes of their own, which is yeah. a really unique way to approach it and really suits the subject matter as well. So instead of Arnie just having a, a melodic theme like in most films, he, he, he gets a certain collection of instruments or whatever, and you know when that's happening, then that's, you know, the Quaid kind of characters is, is the focus there. And he, yeah, it just brilliant brilliant work let me ask you this guys when you get a soundtrack album how do you like them presented because the two total recall releases are very different um the original one they, they both came out by varis sarabond who are obviously a very well-known label in 1990 when it originally came out it was 10 tracks of the score highlights which was very representative of, of albums of the time yeah but they were out of film order so they were presented in order for a listening experience more oh, so okay. than than the uh, representation of you know movie from start to finish right when the deluxe edition came out in 2000, 10 years later, it went from 10 tracks to 27 tracks, complete and in order. This is an example where I actually like both of them, but the expanded one is just more of it, so I like it more, yeah. obviously. But, <laughs> <laughs> but do you guys have an opinion about... I, th- I think it depends on how, um, how much it was chopped and changed in the movie. Like, if you took something like... Uh, what's one you spoke about? Aliens, which was, you know, chopped oh. and changed to death. If, if you probably played that in the context of the film, it probably wouldn't work as well as playing out the actual pieces of music as they were recorded. So maybe it makes it a better listening experience if it's played out as it was recorded rather than the way it appears in the film. Have you ever um, thought about this, Bros? and do you have an opinion? I, I don't own enough soundtracks, really. I'd, I'd probably prefer them in the order they're in the film, but I like the idea of them being reordered to be a better listening experience. Yeah. I mean, that, that's I, I've got no problems with that philosophy. I just don't own enough to to really comment either way. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Because, yeah. 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 as I said, I like both because I really... You know, when that 10 track was the only version, the listening experience from start to finish was great, even though it did go out of order. Yeah. But when it, when it got re released and it was complete and it was put back in order, it was like. Yeah. This, I guess that's the other thing, too. too. If you're talking a 10 track disc, then listening experience is, you know, the primary goal there. Whereas if you're talking about a 25 track or a 28 track release, then you probably want the order of the film at that point. Because 
with a complete soundtrack, you are creating, you should be creating the same journey that the film goes on by listening to the songs in the order of the film. Whereas with a listening experience of 10 tracks, there's so many gaps and so much missing that, yeah, surely that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be nice if people just put thought into these releases and they were released more often but it's, yeah, it's, a, it's like, a great it's a great question but too many soundtracks aren't released so yeah it's like Andrew said it seems that like you know eventually each score has its time you know in the in sun, the sun yeah. and um, there's still a long way to go there's a lot of gems out there that are still you know undiscovered and there's so much stuff fed back to us about like lost masters and that these things can't be tracked down and licensing issues and that but yeah. I mean I remember the day Michael that uh, Predator came out it had been a long time coming for us oh yeah and you know and that's been released numerous times since as well so you know that's had more than its time in the sun but um, it was a big deal for us when that score finally came out and it goes, I think it goes with that saying as well Bros that in 2009 when Back to the Future yeah. finally that's a long awaited score. score release and even the full Which Ghostbusters so the it's, full it's, Ghostbusters yeah. score as well yep same, same kind of thing same year yeah. yeah it just yeah it seems that like you know if you're patient enough Ghostbusters was early it was 2008 because you, you had it when we met in New York I did too. There you go. There you go. <laughs> it's paying attention. I remember. I remember looking at the sleeve of that uh, CD and just thinking, "This is gold. I just need to get you, my hands on." I this. remember the look in his eyes as yeah. well. He was like, you know, like oh, I got to get myself one of these. <laughs> yeah. mm. Have you got it yet, Bryce? Just out of curiosity. Or? Yes and no. Moving on. Got it. <laughs> got it. Okay. <laughs> But yeah, look, if you're, if you're a fan of Jerry Goldsmith or, or particularly this film, um, this soundtrack is very, very highly recommended yeah. from me. It's, a, it's, me one of my, it's one of it's my awesome. favorite scores of all time. Yeah. In regards to alternate versions and deleted scenes from Total Recall, you know what? In regards to deleted scenes, there doesn't seem to be... If there's any, they're not really... This, this was a really tight budget, this film, yeah. to the point where there are sequences for Hoven talks about in the commentary that, you know, we shot it this way because that's all we could afford. You know, we, we, all we had left was all we had. Even the, uh, the CGI stuff that's in there, they, they couldn't do much. So, yeah, that's how tight the budget was. And that seems like an insignificant thing to do is half a day of motion capture but they didn't have the budget so yeah. that's why they went to Mexico to make it happen it's, the budget yeah. was so tight on this and Verhoeven's an experienced director he's not going to overshoot it's all shot on film at this point it's not like digital you can leave it running here and there and, and get some extra bits and pieces so it does not surprise me that there's no extra footage for this indeed the film was initially given an X rating by the MPAA X the following are the scenes that were trimmed to receive an R rating all right Benny's death is optically cropped to remove the, the exiting drill erupting from his stomach the innocent bystander used as a shield was bloodier before they trimmed it as wow. well. The stabbing of Helm in the bar had the bow... Helm's the bad guy with the glasses, by the yeah. way. Um, had the Bowie knife slicing up his stomach. Still oh, of this were actually featured in Fangoria magazine at the time of the film's release, which I really want to see. <laughs> because, you know, you just sort of see the yeah. midget, midget uh, woman come along with the knife and just sort of like stick it in and you just see his expression. See his face, yeah. Which is bad enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's just one of the more violent sort of... Oh, so violent. ...horrific deaths. Like, yeah. 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 <laughs> and then, then she gets up with the machine gun as well, yeah. like on the table. Remember that bit? Yeah. Jumps up on the bar. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it too because the barman's there with her machine gun. She jumps up and he's like, there you go. There's like, yeah. like it's something <laughs> like they've, they've done, done before. Like yeah. Done oh, we yeah. do this all the time. Yeah, there you go. Uh, several shots of the scientist being killed by Quaid after he breaks free from the implant machine were shortened. The scene of Richter's arms being severed was shortened as well. All these little changes were done so that the film wouldn't be X. Yeah. Which is really saying something about the violence, isn't it? As with Robocop, the theatrical release of Total Recall in Australia was an M-rated censored version of the USA R-rated cut, which lacked some of the bloodier moments. Now, okay. a lot of us have seen this version and might have even forgotten about it because the that, R-rated... That'll since, be the version since, that I've seen. Since DVD and Blu-rays have come in, it's been nothing but the R-rated yeah. version. Oh, okay. So if we'd borrowed but, it when it came out, released on VHS at the time, it would have been... That's the version I would have watched I as a kid. remember in the video stores that Total Recall sometimes had two copies of oh, the yeah, video in the two different... There was the M-rated oh, version. Oh, okay. I remember when right. films would do that. That was amazing. Yeah, the yeah, M-rated yeah. version and the and R-rated, the R-rated ah, version. Okay. Now, I also remember going into a video shop Maybe it was before I was 18, maybe. I don't know the first time I saw this film. But I remember, you know, saying I could actually get the M-rated version, how much I would love to get the R-rated version, but they're not going to allow me to. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. can actually recall being in a video shop once and having to make that heartbreaking <laughs> decision. <laughs> but um, the American R-rated cut was released on video as an Australian R. Both the M and R-rated versions are available on video, and some of the cuts in the M-rated version included alternate camera angles in the subway fight after Quaid has been to recall, in the scene where 
Edgemar uh, comes to see Quaid and Laurie, the shot of his brain splattering on the curtain behind him is omitted. <laughs> uh, uh, the awesome. fight in the bar on Mars is edited, in particular the stabbing. Yeah. Uh, Benny's death is severely cut. The frontal shot of the three-breasted woman asking Richter if he would like some fun is replaced with a shot taken from higher up and behind her. Yeah, yeah. And the second last shot of Kerhagen's <laughs> expansion in the atmosphere oh, of Mars yeah, yeah. is shortened and the final shot is removed completely, which is the most Where his ridiculous eyes actually one. come out. And- yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is the most interesting stuff I could find in regards to alternate versions. Yeah. That's interesting yeah. too, isn't it? They shot alternate takes of the things, or they used alternate takes and things for the we've, different versions. We've of actually things. done a few films that have done that. Yeah, we've yeah. spoken about it before, but it's it's just a it's a remarkable idea that that you'd go to that those lengths rather than just cutting something completely. You just indeed, yeah, have something else to go to. Bruce Collectibles from Total Recall is yet another film that makes very little sense. I guess because again, this was rated American. It was rated R. There there aren't any action figures or anything. There's not a hot toys yet of Quaid but it, it'd kind of be a pretty boring figure wouldn't it would you get a Quaid no yeah like uh, John Matrix from Commando is amazing yes and then obviously Terminator and things like that but even Dutch from Predator Dutch from Predator is, yeah, equally is very good so yeah there's no 6 inch figures no 12 inch figures there were um, because this was 1990 there were trading cards uh, <laughs> for Total Recall with the different images from the film uh, 110 in the set so you can track those down if you want <laughs> but yeah that's kind of a about it. Oh, worth mentioning uh, Schwarzenegger called his autobiography Total Recall. That's, uh, that's, that's right. a tie-in for you. Did. Um, the poster, I think, for this film is gorgeous. I love the poster. It's got almost a Kubrick feel or it's got a mm. like it's got a really strong sci-fi background. It's the, the triangle with the light yeah. behind and it. Yeah, Arnie's head. And the red. No, yeah. without Arnie's head, just the red, oh, okay. the red of Mars. Him. Yeah. They added him in later for marketing. Yeah, yeah. of course. Yeah. In the, so the poster's gorgeous for this film too. It's, it's one that looks really elegant, looks really lovely. But other than that, there's, there's nothing. So it's really surprising. There was a novelization. Oh, well, there you go. Uh, Remiss of me not to mention that. So there was a novelization of a film based on a yes. novel. Yes, there was. And it's different to the original. I think it changes it up a little bit as well. I think, from my understanding as well, it was written by Piers Anthony, and he was when he was doing the novel, he was apparently working from an earlier script than the one used for the film. You know, we did say it had oh, four yeah, right. drafts. So he's using like draft that. 33 or something? Yeah. Does the book conclude one way or another if it was a dream? That's a very good question. I, mm. I haven't read it. Yeah. I'm just going by what I've sort of got here. But um, again, I yeah. think I'd really like to. I'd, I'd really, really like to track it down just know. to see. I don't have that. much time for novelizations unless it's supposed to be really good. But, well, there are, yeah. as I said, there are really good ones and there are really poor yeah. ones. Yeah. You've got a few of them, haven't you, Bruce? I've got a few novelizations. I've got Ghostbusters novelization. Is oh. that from 1984? Yeah. Nice. I've never read it, but I've got it. Really? I should read it. I'm really I? surprised you haven't read it. Well, even, even why would I? I've seen the film a hundred times. <laughs> I need to read <laughs> it. Sometimes, yeah. they, sometimes they fill in some gaps. They do. And you've, we've mentioned that in other films yep. before. Yeah. Now, something I did not know about, which really surprised me, was that in um, 1999, there was a television series called Total Recall 2070. Wow. What? The show was meant to be a sequel. However, it had far more similarities with the Blade Runner film than Verhoeven's film. The two-hour series pilot, which was released on DVD and VHS for the North American market, borrowed footage from the film, such as the space cruiser arriving on Mars. But that's all I was able to find on this show. Never heard of it. So what they're saying here is that like it exists. Got to get our hands on that as well. <laughs> yeah, but that's very how interesting. How much do you want to get your hands on something that's hardly known about? Yeah. I mean, how good can it have? I mean, it, Just, I don't yeah. know. How bad could it be? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, very bad. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Clearly. They didn't pick it up. Yeah. So that's just really strange. Mm. But um, never heard anything about it or, you know, before or since. There was a comic book series as well in 2011, uh, a four issue comic book adaption released by Dynamite Entertainment, continuing the story from the film, apparently. Ah. Again, heard very little about this. I don't yeah. know if Total Recall has ever been able to become a franchise of yeah. any sorts. So but, if uh, it's if it's a dream, this film, then continuing the story is just a comatose uh, Schwarzenegger in a <laughs> hospital bed with a fried brain. Oh, is yeah. that, that's, oh, that option where he's had the schizoembolism. That's right. He's <laughs> <is> lobotomized. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. That's it. That's all it is. It's kind of a sad and ending. In that, um, it's the saddest yeah. ending, that, that option. If that is the ending. The, uh, that that yeah. great way that ho- Hollywood shows lobotomies is just a bandage around someone's head <laughs> 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 and a dumb expression on their face. <laughs> so the sequel's just like one flew of the cuckoo's nest. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is the actual sequel to Total Recall. So yes, check indeed. it out. Now, the, I guess the only thing that can be called even remotely a sequel is the 2012 remake of Total Recall. Now, none of us have seen this movie. It, well, it may be a subject of a real chat episode in the future. It'll be worth looking at. Re- well, we, we'll have to look at remakes sooner or later that 
Yeah, for some of the yeah. films we've looked at now. So it'll be worth looking well, at, that, like, I think. And we're going to look at Robocop eventually, so it'll be worth doing those. Like we just said, Michael and I have now decided that we are just going to watch it just so that we can yeah. now, so we can yeah. actually assess it properly rather than just sort of bad. Yeah, I'm curious to have a look at it. necessary remake. So in February 2009, The Hollywood Reporter stated that Neil H. Moritz and original film were in negotiations for developing a contemporary version of Total Recall for Columbia. And in June 2009, it was announced that Columbia Pictures had hired Kurt Wimmer to write the script for the remake. Over a year later, Len Wiseman was hired to direct. On January 9, 2011, it was confirmed that Colin Farrell will be starring in the remake and Brian Cranston would play the villain. According to producer Neil Moritz, this version of the film will be closer to Dick's original story. And Kate Beckinsdale was cast in the role of Agent Laurie, while John Cho was cast as McLean, the smooth-talking rep from the Memory Company. That's a weird character to highlight. Isn't it? Isn't it, yeah. Yeah. And it was released on August 3rd, 2012 and received mixed reviews. And that's pretty much all. That's what we're going to leave this at. And I know a lot of you out there have probably seen Total Recall, but very few people have I spoken to said that, like, it was amazing. I haven't heard anyone, uh, want of a better word, I haven't heard anyone shit can it, though. Like, I haven't heard overly negative things, just nothing particularly positive. Yeah. 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 So I'm curious to check it out, I definitely. Think, I, think yeah, pe- I think I, I think, watch it. I just think that the more that we love this one, the more nervous we are about the fact of how can it, you know. I remember, yeah. I remember when I... I haven't felt the need to see it. I'll but, the, but the other thing too, and, and the, the, the only way I, I... Like in terms of a remake, it's, it's not a remake of the Total Recall film. It's another adaptation of the original yes. yeah. text. And yeah. uh, if you watch the um, special features on the Blu-ray for this... Uh, they changed the original story a lot. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. obviously, all the Mars stuff and the all that stuff is completely new. So, I'm quite happy to look at a, a, a so-called remake, but a new adaptation of the source material. And it, it's not going to be as good as this film. That's fine. But it, it's a valid reason to remake something, I think. So, you watch it too? Yeah, I'll check it out. I'm going to check it out. Maybe, yeah. uh, maybe we've just done a group assignment. Maybe we can do the first oh, ever hello. assignment. All of us. All three of us. Let's do it. And maybe it's going to be Total Recall 2012. Okay. Excellent. Yep. Yeah. Right. Nicely done, bro. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah, How let's exci- do it. I, I've got tingles. <laughs> <laughs> Total I'm, ex- Recall, I'm excited about the idea. 2012 Total Recall is going to be the first group assignment. The yeah. assignment. Excellent. We've all got to come in and speak for one minute about what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be the shortest podcast ever. <laughs> <laughs> in regards to the, um, the awards... For Total Recall, the most notable one, which is interesting, was the one at the Academy Awards in 1991. It won a Special Achievement Award for visual effects. Four of them, four yeah. of the, the team, the special effects team. So this is interesting too. The, the CGI effects team aren't credited in the original theatrical release. It's just the company name, not yep. the individual technicians or whatever, or the artists. Then when this was nominated for special effects, the uh, Verhoeven and, and the producers of the four people they were sending up to accept the award, they chose the guy that headed up the CGI FX team. And he was really shocked because they weren't given a specific credit or anything. You know, it's only a small element, that X-ray sequence, but they were really uh, shocked and impressed that they, they counted as being that important and integral to the, the film. On the subsequent VHS release, those guys all got their credits. Um, and I think on the Blu-ray they get a credit, whereas okay. the theatrical release they don't. It did get altered later. Yeah. So it was kind of nice that uh, Verhoeven and the producers said, okay, you, you can go up and accept as well as the practical effects guys That's because cool. your contribution was that significant. Yep. So, yeah, yep. it's really cool. It was also nominated at the, at the 91 Academy Awards for Best Sound and also Best Effects Sound Effects Editing. It is phenomenal. So. And we kind of joked about it once before about one of the uh, soundtrack releases had an effects uh, track at the end of it. But this is another film where it'd be great to have some of these effects to listen to. They, yeah, they just love to hear the sound of Harry's neck getting crunched. <laughs> bone crunching. <laughs> like, okay, yeah. Or yeah. bone crunching. Or you could just eat more celery. I yeah. mean, that's <laughs> the same sounds up to you. Same sound. Look at celery the same way. yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no Golden Globe Awards or nominations. But, of course, let's go to the Satins. Because look at this, bros. Look at these list of nominations at the Satins. First of all, the two that it won, it won Best Science Fiction Film. Yep. And Best Costumes, which is really interesting. <laughs> I guess it has been. Oh, yeah? Yeah, okay. Costumes. That's interesting. Yeah. But there's a massive list here for nominations at the Satins. Um, <laughs> best Actor, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Well, if he was ever going to win a Satin for acting, this, this yeah, is probably the one. Be. Yep. Yeah. Uh, best Supporting Actress, Rachel DeCotton. Mm-hmm. Yep. Best director, Paul Verhoeven, like he should be. Best writing, Ronald Schusett, Dan O'Bannon, and Gary Goldman. Best music for Jerry Goldsmith. Why the hell didn't that win? I want to see what won the Saturn for best music yeah. in uh, that year. That's for sure. Maybe Bruce can track it down for us. Best makeup, 
best special effects as well. So the visual effects team there. So yeah, fair enough. Yeah, it got well represented at the Saturns like it should. Yeah, like it would have always. Like yeah. it should. So in 2008 as well, Total Recall was nominated for AFI's Top 10 Science Fiction Films list. Wow. So that's, that's, that's pretty damn high. Yeah, it is. It's incredible. Would you really? put Total Recall in the top 10? In sci-fi, I wouldn't, probably wouldn't put it in my top... Oh, jeepers. I don't know. It's a tough one. It's a tough one. I do love this film. <laughs> yeah, me too. I think, I think top 10 for sci-fi is probably a stretch, really, of all films of all time. Oh, yeah. uh, just quickly, the Saturn for the best music uh, for a motion picture, uh, science fiction, Alan Silvestri, Back to the Future 3. Because okay. it was, wow. Because that year it was an 89-90 combined awards. Yeah, right. So, And other films that I was up against, uh, Back to the Future 3 won, The Abyss, <laughs> The Fly 2, Ghost, Gremlins oh, 2, The, the Guardian, so Alan Silvestri again. Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, uh, Total Recall, The Witches, and Santa Sangre. So Back to the Future 3 won the Saturn Over. for best music that year. Yeah. But it was a combined year, 89-90. Yeah. Yeah, I'm so torn right now. <laughs> Because I, well, I, I, that, I mean, those scores. Back, back, back <laughs> yeah, to the Future is not the best Back to the Future score, but uh, Back to the Future 3 is not the best score. But I love that score too. That's such a ripping yeah. score, yeah. I just sort of got really torn just then. Oh. I just spoke Adam, uh, be, no. I but anyway. Adam, great, Adam's great year, heart. Film music. Yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> Interesting, <laughs> interestingly, Back to the Future didn't win in 85, and Back to the Future part... Two wasn't oh, wouldn't have been. wasn't even nominated. Two's the weakest of the three. It wasn't even nominated as far as the score is concerned. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, not even nominated. It's still great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yeah. Um, the Rotten Tomatoes website certifies Total Recall fresh with a score of eighty four percent, forty three positive, and eight negative, and IMDb score of seven point five out of ten. I think it's pretty you know, good. Fits yeah. where, it, where it should. Yeah. yeah. The critical reaction to Total Recall was mostly positive. Uh, Roger Ebert awarded the film three and a half stars out of four calling it one of the most complex and visually interesting science fiction movies in a long time. Owen Gleiberman of Entertainment Weekly gave it a score of B+, and said that it starts out as a mind-bending futuristic satire, and then turns relentless and becomes a violent post-punk version of an Indiana Jones cliffhanger. Film scholar Willem Buckland considers it one of the more sublime Philip K. Dick adaptions, contrasting it with films like Imposter and Paycheck, which he considered ridiculous. Mick LaSalle of the San Francisco Chronicle said the film is not a classic, but it's still solid and entertaining. James Bernardinelli gave the film two and a half stars out of four, saying that neither Schwarzenegger nor Verhoeven have stretched their talents here, but added with a script that's occasionally as smart as it is energetic, Total Recall offers a little more than wholesale carnage. <laughs> And some critics such as Janet Maslin of the New York Times considered the film excessively violent. Surprise, surprise. Rita Kempley of the Washington Post gave it a negative review, saying that director Paul Verhoeven disappoints with this appalling onslaught of blood and boredom. What the hell's that? <laughs> Feminist cultural critic Susan Faludi called it one of an endless stream of war and action movies in which women are reduced to mute and incidental characters or banished altogether. Oh, it's a bit of a stretch. I, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. I don't think the female characters are, are purely eye candy, and I think yeah. they do contribute to the plot. They're quite and, powerful. And quite like powerful, a, and strong women. One. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. I mean, they give, they give the little... They're, they're still secondary characters, but it's a Schwarzenegger film, so it's always yeah. going to be Schwarzenegger first. But And they're not as strong as Linda Hamilton, I guess, in T2, but there's... Uh, yeah. Bizarre. <laughs> How many are, though, bro? No, exactly. Well, that's the thing, yeah. I mean, yeah. Furosa in Fury Road and yeah. so, Sarah Connor. Mm. So just let, let's wrap up Total Recall quickly with our traditional five-star review system, bros. Bros, once again, oh, I'm going to pass the baton to you. Torturous. Look, I'm going to give it three and a half stars. It's a yep. solid film. It's not my favourite Schwarzenegger film, but it's definitely part of those, that, as we said earlier, those key Schwarzenegger films. The, the, these. So what are they, bros? Commando? For me, well, for me, Commando, Total Recall, I love The Running Man, Twins and uh, Kindergarten Cop are up there, Terminator 1 and 2. There's probably one or two I've forgotten out of that list. So there's a good eight films there where Schwarzenegger is on song. We've talked about this with Schwarzenegger a lot. You need the right director to get a performance out of Schwarzenegger that is credible and that is good. And Verhoeven, I would even go so far to say, I think Verhoeven directs Schwarzenegger better than James Cameron does. I think James Cameron's really good at using Schwarzenegger's limitations in a film so that he doesn't stretch him or push him too much whereas Verhoeven's really pushed him here and really made him work hard for a, a, a conceptual film that Schwarzenegger's really not good enough to be in but he really nails it in this yeah. so like we were saying it's one of his best performances at, from an acting perspective e easily one of his best performances probably top three and he doesn't need some sidekick running around explaining the exposition everything just flows and it's really well done three and a half stars if you've never seen it before check it out it, it's a really good fun flick 
And like we were talking earlier, there's a lot to think about. So yeah, just quickly as well, just before I get to your review, Michael, Total Recall isn't just a boys movie either. I I know for a fact that a lot of uh, you know female friends over the years have talked about this film and how much they love it and find okay. it entertaining. So it's not. I, t- I tend to assume it is, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Me too. But yeah. I was surprised. Well, it's not as mindless as a a Commando or a Running yeah, Man true. or a. Like it's got a little bit more thought to it. And uh, yeah. the other thing too is I would go as far as to say if you like if you like Blade Runner, check this out as well because there are. Blade Runner elements to this film Definitely. obviously the, the same source writer but yeah it, it's handled differently but it, yeah, it's still well worth watching yeah. Yeah. yeah Michael yeah look this is just an immensely uh, entertaining film um, it's it's also very deep uh, complex film as well so yeah, as I said earlier you can sort of you can enjoy this purely for its popcorn merits or you can really um, sort of you know, talk about it and sort of delve into it and uh, I think I think that's great um, I think uh, it's, it's shot beautifully um, it's got you know amazing sort of effects and cinematography Arnie look it's, it's probably up there with one of Arnie's you know best films you know I think probably T2 is probably the, the pinnacle of Arnold Schwarzenegger um, and, and then maybe followed by Predator and probably this film over Overall, oh, look, I'm, I'm torn between four and four and a half. I think I'm going to go. I think I'm going to go four stars for this one, and, and highly recommend it. Yep, yep. Nice. Yeah, myself as well. Yep, yep, yep. Just quickly, yeah, four stars. It's um, it's fantastic though. Um, yeah, I can't. I can get really which is that's a word that uh, Schwarzenegger uses to describe it. Fantastic. Uh, in one of the interviews, fantastic. yeah, fantastic. Uh, I think genius. Yes. <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, that that might be how he would describe Paul yeah. Verhoeven. Yeah. I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, look, Total Recall is just like you know, it's fantastic science fiction. It's really, really good storytelling based on um, Philip K. Dick's material. Arnold Schwarzenegger, definitely one of his best performances. It's so much fun, this movie. Like Every single time I watch it, it doesn't diminish over time. And, and it, the, the things that date it over time as well, it doesn't diminish it, your experience of watching the movie. So it's got everything that I need to see in a Schwarzenegger vehicle and then gives you, like we were talking about before, Michael, a little bit more. As you yeah. said, it's the thinking person's science fiction action film. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So And I, I think some great female characters, memorable female Yeah, I thought so. I well. think so too. Yeah. And mm. yeah, I just think there's a great merging of all of it. And, uh, but it also so, pokes fun at itself as well. And it is, oh, it is it's a riot, it's laugh, some of it, really. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just have so much fun. And if you yeah. haven't seen it, what are you doing? You know, yeah, like, exactly. get onto it for sure. Yeah. So highly recommend it as well. So four stars. Yeah. Bros, it is now time for... The Assignment. The, uh, the assignment's been on sabbatical for a while. It's been on hiatus. It's been MIA. I feel I've missing yeah, I've been in action. Dragging, my sh- dragging the chain with the, this one. Uh, well, because you know Michael was the last one to be assigned a film, and, and, and he only pops up every now and then, so it's hard to g- get him in the chair. For those that don't know, this time it's quite simple. Each of us take turns challenging another team member to watch a film they wouldn't normally watch, or that's out of their comfort zone, or that they've declared in the past that they never want to see. And then we challenge them to come back and present a positive review, at least sixty seconds of positivity about the the film that's been handed out. Now, Michael's assignment was handed out by Adam, was it? No, who handed it out to... No, I did. Adam it handed me, it off to, to Michael. That's right. The tale of Annie. That's yeah. right. I was I was given um, oh, that piece of shit fucking <laughs> crap film, whatever <laughs> it was. Lynch. David Lynch thing. Inland um, Empire. That's Inland Empire. That's what it was called. Inland Empire to Annie and Annie to one of only three board games to ever be adapted <laughs> into a film. Clue Which, being the uh, the one we covered a couple of weeks ago here in Real, Real Chat. Correct. Ouija or Ouija board was adapted into a couple of different horror films over the years and is that a board game? it was originally a board game correct okay, yeah. uh, and Battleship and we're not talking Battleship Potankum we're talking about uh, <laughs> well, well Milton see, Bradley's see, Battleship I chose yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're not uh, classic at I, all I chose Battleship for Michael because in recent times like Michael is getting less and less tolerant of the mindless action movie yeah, and yeah. as you've heard on Real Chat before, he used to be a big fan of this schlock, but uh, upon a time. but not anymore. Not no, anymore. He's, more, he's too intellectual he now. He's, substance. He needs more oh, substance. Yeah. He needs more depth. It's he wants to high brow for this. I, mean, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I do get the feeling that halfway through Battleship, Michael wished he was somewhere else dreaming, <laughs> but not quite the same as Total Recall. Before Sorry. I start, have either of you guys seen Battleship? Nope. No, okay, I'd oh, never okay, see that God. shit. <laughs> 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 okay, just, just checking. <laughs> so, bro- uh, you have uh, 60 seconds, uh, Mr. Hadjan, to say positive things right, about Battleship, and your time starts now. 
Okay, I'll start off by saying this this isn't this is not the worst film adapted from a game. Um, I'd say Doom um, and Mortal Kombat Annihilation are worse <laughs> movies than this one. So it's not the absolute worst movie coming from a game. But you've seen um, those two, right? Um, I, I have seen those two. <laughs> um, uh, I, I like the fact that they've weaved into the context of the film a bunch of guys looking at a like a, a screen with a grid and yelling out like coordinates like C11 <laughs> and shooting missiles at them so they actually work the context of the board game into the movie which is quite incredible um, there's some cool battleships in the movie luckily which you know one would expect but they, <laughs> they work the MS USS Missouri into it shooting its cannons that was kind of cool um, oh shit how much more time have I got 10 seconds um uh, Ooh. Um, I'm gonna add I'm gonna special add. effects are good special effects uh, I can't add. question special effects yep they're good alright Let's and just come on, guys! Time. Just, just you're killing me. Just <laughs> wow! Wow! That, okay. That's that's the that's the biggest struggle we've had to try and <laughs> say positive By things about a film. country mile. Yeah, as well. Yeah, like, that was I think, sensational. I think he's just saying something. Like that he, is, he struggled. This wow, movie you, is fucking terrible. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Tell okay. us what you really think. All right. So, it's, first of all, before I see anything, I see two hours and 11 minutes pop up. Before I oh, see, that's like, already see wrong. Two no. hours and 11 minutes. Like, how the hell do you stretch this movie out to two hours and 11 minutes? A game of Battleship only takes 12 but minutes. But then again, like, this, this movie is not allowed to take itself seriously, right? This is Battleship the movie, right? Like, you know, if you see snakes on a plane, you want to see, bam, snakes. If you want to see uh, Sharknado, you want to see, bam, sharks. You sit through about 20 minutes of the film, where the fuck are the battleships? <laughs> Seriously, the first, this is about an alien invasion, this film is shit hurtling through space, and then there's like this dropkick dude stealing a burrito from like a 7 Eleven store to the theme of the Pink Panther, and I'm thinking, what the fuck's going on? Where are the ships? <laughs> This movie is about an alien invasion, and then like sh- like battleships get shoehorned into it, and it's just like yeah. it's not a movie about aliens. Like this could have just been a movie about. I, I I don't remember watching any alien invasion films where they go, you know, the best way to get these guys, yeah, battleships, <laughs> battleships will do it. That's what we want. What about airplanes? Oh, yeah. Shut up. Battleships! Yeah, this movie only would have been good if you had, like, real sort of strong, like, uh, tongue-in-cheek actors like, you know, Ryan Reynolds or Chris Pratt or somebody that could really carry it or... A Bill or, Pullman. Or, or, yeah, or a <laughs> Bill Pullman. <laughs> or you had, like, a fantastic screenplay and fantastic actors. And, I mean, it is mostly no names, you know, and sometimes that's a good thing, but they are all terrible actors. Rihanna, fucking stick to singing. <laughs> like, oh. everyone, everyone in this movie is bad. Liam Neeson's in this movie. Did you know that? Yeah, right. Liam Neeson is, I- like... Phoned in like you wouldn't believe. So <laughs> this like movie. Star Wars. Yeah, yeah, big yeah, right. time. But okay. he's just playing a hard ass. I, I think I've said enough. This movie uh, the, is is the line I, I just shunk, sunk your battleship used no. in the film at all? No, it's not. But actually, the, you know the aliens shoot. They shoot these big like canisters that look like pegs, and they fly through the air, <laughs> and they actually land the deck of the ship, <laughs> like a peg, and then they explode. Oh no! <laughs> like, oh, what a what a clever tying in of the. Are there red ones and white ones? No, they're all like, like, yellow canisters. Yellow ones. <laughs> Oh wow! Oh, anyway, that's, uh, I've seen it. Up. You know what they should have been? They should have been like movie. they should have been like the Russian army or something, and they should have got defeated quickly because yeah. they just lined all their ships up side by side. Yeah, yeah, like the worst way to get. I love that they're using like C yeah. twelve and and B eleven or whatever instead oh, yeah, of using was... proper coordinates. <laughs> the Why radar, are they using the, coordinates? No, the radars are down, and there's a grid of these like um, <laughs> uh, what do you call them? Uh, tsunami boys, or as Americans call them, tsunami buoys. They're, they're like forming yeah, yeah. grid in the water, and as the um, alien ships go past them, it sends out frequencies. So they're seeing like these things go off on this grid, and it's they're, it's, they're yelling the coordinates out to where oh, to shoot the missile. That's missa. ridiculous. It's, yeah. That's ridiculous. <laughs> uh, the morning after Michael watched this, he sent me a text message that said, OMG, worst movie ever. <laughs> <laughs> you turn into the comic book guy. Oh, my God. Yeah. It's, yeah. Oh my so, God. Acting in this is just something else. It is just really bad. And apparently there, there was no... Was there, there was no merit. merit. The, look, the, the effects were really good. I mean, this is like a Michael Bay wannabe. Essentially, this film was Transformers. Like The whole alien element to this, it was all like these mechanical contraptions and it was like... So what, you, what you're like saying is what everyone's been waiting for, Transformers meets Pearl Harbor. That's Pretty what you're much. saying. Oh, yeah, it was. It is. <laughs> <laughs> it's totally what a pitch. What a pitch. Oh, you guys God. like Transformers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And Pearl Harbor did all right. Hey, yeah. hey. <laughs> anyway, I think, I think we've talked about this enough. Yeah. In terms of the hand of the assignment, I think Bryce just did it for us. I think, yeah. I think you the did. total recall three-way assignment is, yeah. uh, is on go. the cards. Yeah. In the next few weeks, we'll check out... 
Total Recall uh, 2012. Which yeah. will just leave uh, Matt to do it, uh, to do a solo one. That's right. Work in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Yeah. Or maybe we'll try and get Matt in that episode. We'll see how Bruce, we go. Bruce, do you want to tell us a little bit about one of your ideas for a, a segment that could make uh, you yes. alongside the assignment? The, uh, it's time to launch some newer segments. The next one we're going to go, uh, it will start passing around. We, we'll keep the, the assignment going as well. But yeah. uh, uh, the Guilty Pleasure is, is going to be a new uh, segment on like Real Chat. One. And it's quite simple. Everybody has a film or a handful of films that they know are complete pieces of rubbish. They know that they're just the cheesiest, corniest, trashiest pieces of film ever made, but you can't resist watching them and you can't resist trying to get people to, to, to watch them if they've not seen them before. I would, to a degree, Commando is one of those films for me, but there are many others where I know it's a big cheese fest, but I love watching that film and I'll watch it every 18 months or so and, and enjoy the hell out of it. And it's nice to find like-minded people. But uh, the guilty pleasure, revealing a little bit more, I guess, about uh, the real chat hosts uh, tastes, I guess, getting a little bit deeper. Definitely. Um, but yeah, we'll be doing the guilty pleasure very soon on Real Chat. Excellent. Sounds great. Bring it on. Sounds really good. But like you said, mm. we're running alongside the assignment. The assignment. The yeah. assignment's, assignment's a lot of fun. And you know, anyone listening, if you want to, um, you know, on social media, send us a message of what your guilty pleasure is. It'll be cool to find out those films that people uh, can't get enough of. So. Absolutely, and mm. the same goes for the assignment. If you've got, uh, if you if you want to challenge one of us to uh, to a film. Yeah, I'm then sure let we'll us know. to do it. Uh, what are our details? We're realchat.com.au. We're Real Chat on Facebook. And we're at Real Chat Podcast on Twitter. Twitter. Yeah. Yes, so Track us down. Everyone, everyone listening is going, he should know what they are. He says it after he every bloody it, show. Yeah. I said that exactly the same way as well. I said that <laughs> once, really said it once eight months ago. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't said it since. <laughs> We really uh, should re-record a better sound. I we think. should. We should do a better <laughs> audio quality version of that one. Anyway, guys, thanks very much for coming out and talking about Total Recall. Um, it's been a pleasure. Been not a problem. Yeah, it was a good fun. It's a good film to uh, to revisit. So, Definitely. Yeah, it's exciting. And, um, yeah, we will speak to you guys soon. Thanks, thanks very much. Thank you. Yeah. Bye-bye. Stay in touch with us by visiting realchat.com.au. Check us out on Facebook. You can follow us on Twitter at Real Chat Podcast. Instagram, real underscore chat underscore podcast and if you haven't already catch up with past episodes and subscribe to new episodes on itunes